You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Welcome to the Trap Talk Reptile Podcast YouTube channel. Also, audio platforms such as Buzzsprout, Apple, um, Google Play. All the major audio platforms you can listen to the Trap Talk Reptile Podcast. I'm your boy, MJ. What is good? If this is your first time tapping in, do your boy a favor. um, Hit that like button. Smash that subscribe button so you're on top of every single piece of content. I put out here and hit that notification bell. That way you're not getting slept on. I'm telling you right now, man, I bring the best of the best to this channel, all wrapped around keeping, breeding, and keeping reptiles, man. Sometimes we get into the conversational pieces of uh, animals and uh, different animals and whatnot, but man, it's mainly about the reptiles, and that's what I love. So if you uh, are on that same tip as me, well, then you're in the right place. Get ready, because this is going to be the round two of In Russo, and I'm super excited. Um, shout out to the early birds. I see you guys. I'll get to you guys in just a second. Uh, but you guys know how we get things cracking off on this channel. Uh, this episode is brought to you by my man, Gary Shavino over at GS Reptiles. Favorite YouTuber. I mean, dude, I'm, I, I just got to say, if it comes to having to look at reptiles and then laugh at the same time, um, this is the, this is this is it. I mean, I'm, I'm a humorous guy, but I love reptiles. This is like you get the best of both worlds with Gary Shavino. Gary, thank you so much for your support. Um, please guys, if you do not know who the hell Gary Shafino is, God bless you. I don't know how that's the case. Uh, but go over to Instagram, type in GS reptiles, go follow him. And then also go to YouTube, type in GS reptiles and go subscribe to his content. Especially if you are curious about getting into chondros or some amazing arboreal species, I'm telling you right now, this guy lays it all down for all of us. And we are lucky to have somebody like Gary Shavino. Also, this episode is brought to you by... Brian Barcheck and the entire Barcheck family over at the Reptarium. Man, I'm so excited to see what's to come from the Reptarium. I love the Barcheks. Just want to say, first and foremost, anybody out there who's Brian Strong, shout out to you. Uh, make sure you head over to Facebook and go be a part of the page that Kevin McCurley started uh, just to kind of show our love and support for Brian. Um, and just keep him in his, keep, keep all positive thoughts for Brian. Um, if anyone's going to beat this shit, it is Brian Barcheck, okay? And also say, fuck cancer on the count of three, one, two, three, fuck cancer. Piece of shit. Hate cancer, man. Terrible things. <sighs> love you, Brian. Uh, and then love anyone out there who's backing my boy up. Uh, I do want to say if you're looking for exclusive content, if you want to uh, see more than what you see here on this podcast, if you want to get more behind the scenes, if you want to meet the trappers, and what I mean by the trappers, I mean over 160 people, part of the Patreon page that I started three years ago, and it's growing. If you want to become a part of this, do me a favor. Go down to the very first link that you see below. Join the Trap Talk Patreon family. One of the biggest benefits about being a part of the Trap Talk Patreon family is you get a link to the Discord, which would tap you in with over 160 people who are about this long-term longevity keep stuff. You feel me? All about the reptiles, man, but it's also about life stuff and just connecting and networking. Like, you ain't going to do this by yourself. I'm telling you right now, you are not going to do this by yourself in this day and age. You need people. Uh, but you need the right kind of people. You need positive people. You need people to kind of lay you the right stepping stones because everybody who's successful in this reptile industry has been giving some some sort of stepping stone, I feel like. Just saying. Especially somebody new, right? Um, I know I have. I've been giving too many. Uh, so God bless all the help I've been out there. And I just want to pass that down. And uh, I, I think I do a good job with all my trappers. And I love you guys so much. Seriously, the coolest Patreon family in the world. That's the Trap Talk family. I love you guys so much. Trap Fest is going to be epic. Hope you're ready because Trap Fest is super iconic. Also, follow me on Instagram, Trap Talk God 619 If you want to see what I have going on behind me, if you want to tap into my projects and see what's happening with my animal keeping side of my life, because this is this podcast comes second. What comes first is what's behind me. Just so you know, I wake up every day, do my thing, and slave to these animals. Okay. So if you want to see how that's going for me, go follow me on Instagram. And um, I don't know. Give me, give me a little bit on YouTube, please. I mean, I know we have this cracking, but I also have a YouTube channel called The Trap Vlogs. I have like a, man, I don't know what it is, but it's coming. Maybe go go, go subscribe to my channel on Trap Vlogs. Go give me some, some courage over there, and I'll eventually get things cracking, guys. Give me, give me a little bit. It's just, there's a lot going on, as you guys know. So day by day, um, shout out on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, show me some love as well. Drop a like, drop a heart, 
And um, also, if you are active in the super chats, man, I mean, if you're active in the live chats, drop a super chat. If you have a question for uh, Vin Russo and this special guest who's about to pull up here uh, and join us, please don't be shy with the super chats. Let's get the super chats cracking. Early birds, who's ready for Vin Russo? I'm ready for Vin Russo. Lindsay, Pico Pythons, I'm excited for this one too. Shout out to the homegirl, Lindsay. The big homie, Mark Curley in the building. Constrictor Connection, what is up, buddy? Um, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Big Row 5.0, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Appreciate your support, dog. 1776 Exotics, the big Mike in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. OG Patreon member. Uh, big West in the building, Sunshine State Sulfurs. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. The homie Jordan in the building. Uh, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. The homie Heathen Hatchery, my dog. Big Brian in the building, Trap Talk Patreon member. Uh, Trap Talk management team, thank you so much for your support, dog. It really means a lot. John, who's also part of the Trap Talk Patreon family. I got nothing but hitters, I'm telling you right now. Big Eclipse in the building, Sweden player. Trap Talk Patreon member, we're already talking imports. Maybe he's, maybe he's going to get some trap heat, or maybe he's going to get one of a trap homies heat. Either way, I want to plug you up. It's my dog right here. Patreon member from Sweden. We are global in this shit. Nick Shanky, what's good, Nick Shanky? Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Good to see you, player. Villarino, Emilio. Villarino Reptiles, one of the freshest, sickest players to join the Trap Talk Patreon family. Seriously, one of my brothers, man. I'm, I'm pretty close to this guy. That he, he encourages me a lot, but also encourages a lot of other people who are relevant in what we do. So go follow my boy, Emilio, from Villarino Reptiles. Make sure you go watch our podcast, New Breed on the Block series we had a few months back. One of the best I've ever had on that series with this guy. So make sure you go check him out. Up and comer. Somebody who dedicates himself by going to shows, meeting people. He's a real deal, Holyfield. Emilio Villarino. Villarino Reptiles, my dog. FTL Reptiles. Homie Levi in the building. Trap Talk. Patreon member all day, every day. Appreciate it so much. Aiden. What's up, Aiden? Aiden on a cruise. Gotta love it, man, to be young. Enjoy, little buddy. Uh, Blunt Man Reptiles in the building. Trap Talk. Patreon member all day, every day. How's that trap heat doing for you, buddy? Hope it's doing good. House of Hiss. I love this couple right here, man. Go give them a follow. Trap Talk. Patreon members all day, every day. JKJ Reptiles in the building. What's up, player? Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day, and tomorrow's payday. <laughs> this fool got some sick ass heat. Go fuck with him, please. I'm telling you right now, he has some serious heat from the trap. I mean, Josh, skeletons and feathers on his monitor game, and I mean tree monitors. This guy's a player. Don't sleep on this guy. And he breeds uh, amazing beaded lizards. This guy's a real deal from SoCal. My homie Josh. Skeletons and feathers. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. I'm telling you, we only have nothing but hitters. Cream Pythons in the building. What's up, buddy? Stay creamy. Deviant Glass in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Bruce Carpenter. Hey, Bruce. How you doing, buddy? Uh, thanks for being here. Chip Endo. Be careful, guys. He's a stickler. Chip, Chip Endo in the building. He'll ruin your day. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. And Chip, we will get our episode in, I promise you. Uh, Justin Campbell. What's up, Justin Campbell? Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. SH Pythons in the building. Piyush Patel in the building. What's up? And here we have the first super chat. My boy just always sets the tone. That's why he is above all scales. My dog, Ricky Bobby, SRT, a real one. Trap Talk, Patreon member, Team Zoo Dreams. All the way to the top. I'll see you, my man. That's my, that's my boy. Big Keys in the building. Damn, we got a hitter in the building right here. Big Keys. Appreciate you, dog, for tapping in. Out of Space Reptiles, what is good? Thanks for tapping in. Damn, we have Prolific, the homie Aaron in the building. Where'd you go? There you are. What's up, Aaron? Aaron, Trap Talk patron member all day, every day. The mayor of Condro Town. And we are going to end this with the, the sickest person we can end this with in the chat. No disrespect. Lots of amazing people in the chat. We, we're going to get this episode started right now because it is round two with Ben Russo time. And the mayor of Condro Town has blessed, blessed us with an amazing celebrity appearance in the live chats. Guys, Bill Steele, ladies and gentlemen, Phoenix Reptiles. Go follow Phoenix Reptiles right now top two chondro breeder in the world when it comes to traps uh scorecard i love you bill love the whole steagle family bill steagle also trap talk patreon member all day every day i am blessed guys let's go do what you gotta do to get your mind right stay hydrated drink up water that is okay and uh yeah strap up dude it's gonna get fucking heavy especially when you see who's tapping in here to join me and this guy named Vin Russo, the man, the myth, the legend, coming at you for that round two, episode 314. Let's go. Cheers. You ready to do, do more in the future? Trap yes. Talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Holy.
Only trap talk. Exclusive. Yes, exclusive. Oh. So stop calling us. <laughs> From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, gotta love it, love it or not. I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the Everybody, we do it. Everybody, we do it. live with Ben Russo for that round two. Ben, how you doing, buddy? Good. How are you, man? Oh, I'm excited. I'm very excited. Um, dude, does it kind of annoy you when you got people like me this excited just to talk to you? I mean, I'm just curious. Are you, looking, like, are you looking at me like this fucking guy, man? Like, what the fuck? Like, I'm just curious. Because this is all natural excitement. I just want to let you know. I don't do any enhancements or anything like that. I really love what the legacy that you've created with your own bloodline that I keep in my racks. I'm just saying. For a, for a newbie, I consider myself a newbie. This this is iconic. Anytime you ever become on the show, I'm gonna have this excitement. So, Ben, thank you for being here. Appreciate you. But how you doing, buddy? Good. Thanks for having me, man. How's it going for your 2023 so far? You know, we we got we got Tinley right around the corner, literally. But how's it been so far? We got we're first quarter in right now. What's how, how's it going for you? Good. Uh, you know, a lot of snakes are breeding still. So, um, lots of ovulations and looks like it's gonna be a good. A good year this year we'll see i don't like to jump the gun but so right. far so good i mean it's uh i mean at what age did you stop jumping the gun um I mean, and, and what i mean by that it's like i have this thing where i have patience until right at the last minute i want to get excited and post something about it and then that's when shit just goes to you know but like it seems like after years of experience some people just some people don't even post anything until they have like them eating and stuff like that. Are you on that level when it comes to not jumping the gun or, or how do you, how do you really like what's jumping the gun to you is what I was what I'm trying to get at right now. Yeah. I've, I've learned that you don't um, count your boas before they've <laughs> been born. So anything so can happen, you know? So I'm very, I try to be patient and I do, I, I am tight lipped about a lot of things. You know, I, I don't, advertise things that i have until i have enough to you know to sell because that that's a double-edged sword too so yeah I, i've learned to have patience and you know it's not over till it's over so to how, speak how did i mean do you ever have you ever done like people who've been so like on top of a project that you're doing that you you create wait lists before they're even born or do you not do wait lists no, I used to do that a long time ago, and I stopped a long time ago simply because, um, you know, the whole wait list thing for me, the problem was karma. <laughs> you know, I put, I'd put together a wait list for things, and they wouldn't happen. Wow. You know, or I'd put together a wait list of things, and I wouldn't have enough to fill it. Um, and then here's the other problem with the wait list. You put you you put together a wait list and you tell people, all right, they're born and they're ready to go. You know, s send the money. And nine out of ten people are like, oh, I, I need a new transmission for my or car some, or something with life. It's always yeah, something, yeah, yeah. right? And it's so like it, it's like you can't really get mad at them, but it's also like, so yeah, of course that's what it is, right? It's like go figure, like right when I have yeah. what you need. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of that kind of goes with just people inquiring about animals. I mean, I can't tell you how much because i'm a big believer in like you build relationships um and trying to build rapport with people but also like people will take that for a run too and just drain you out until you're like okay listen i don't know what you want from me anymore like i'm just now i'm just like 
you know, I got to move on with my life, but it comes with the territory, right? I mean, I don't know. It's, it's just got to got to learn how to bob and weave through it, I guess, right? Well, the fortunate thing for me is that I've written books about it. So I just tell people, you know, if you're really serious, my book. About, <laughs> if you're really serious about these animals, why don't you read, read the book, you know, because I think about it. Wow. I tell people the same thing all the time. I could, I can answer your questions or you can read a whole chapter in a book, you know? Yeah, buddy. So. I keep mine very close, Vin. <laughs> I keep mine very close, buddy. Um, you know, listen, I, 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 now that Dave's coming on, Dave Levison, and, you know, he's, he's going to come fashionably Dave, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I've done like kind of a lot of bit of the uh, just slow down and just diving into just stuff that's worked for you. And, um, you know, but the title of, of what I have is, um, you know, really involving temp cycling and food cycling. Um, is, is that something you need to do? Is that something you have to do? Um, mainly because, like I said, I, I, I came into a situation where I was trying to have success breeding boas again uh, this year. But the fem- I gave the female I had success with a, a year off, and I tried with another female, did it about the same time, and uh, just nothing, you know, nothing happened. Uh, no, nothing was really receptive. But, I, but like I was telling you, I saw a lot of like inverted inverted lane and just weirdness from her in like August. And so I don't know, Vin, I, I feel like there's something I could be missing because I have people like Mark Bailey. I don't know if you know who Mark Bailey is, um, mm-hmm. but I know people, man, where they have shit so seasonally down. Like it's crazy. Like, and, and like, and if it's not, if they have something that isn't on their time, they know how to adjust it to make it go on their time. And I don't know if that's, like, how am I missing how to do that? Or, or is that something that you do? Or, you know, that's kind of my biggest thing for tonight's episode. And we can even get into that right now, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I noticed when the um, Internet got pop was popularized as far as um, forums and people posting pictures of their babies. I noticed that boa, well, people that were breeding boas were having litters all year round. You know, and for me, I only have my litters from, you know, the earliest May and the latest September. So and that means they're breeding in the the middle of the winter to the spring. So I've set up my my facility in that manner because I can't I can't afford to heat the building when it's cold out, meaning if it's the cold time of year, I'm giving them a cooler time of year, all of the animals. Right. So, but what I noticed was a lot of a lot of people that were a lot of beginners too. Well, we're talking about what you just said. They had a female like in August who looked like she was, you know, building eggs, and you know, they th- luckily threw a male with it, and the females got grabbing and had babies in the middle of the winter, which would never happen in my building because all of my animals are on a different schedule, and it's not only temperature; it's also food. You know, if you put them on a, fo- a feeding regimen that's, you know, conducive of egg development at the wrong time of year, then a lot of snakes will develop eggs that time of year. It doesn't have to be seasonal. But to do it again the, the year after is difficult because your building or wherever you're keeping your animals may have a different seasonality that doesn't coincide with what you tricked them into the first time. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, <clears throat> throughout all the years, if you've been working with different stuff, you've always kept boas with other species, right? So you've always yeah. bred stuff in the same room? Yeah. Okay. So they're all in the same season. They all have the coldest time of year for them. The coldest I – can't, I can't use the word cold because I don't really let things get cold. But the coolest, right. coolest yeah. time of year is my coolest time of year here in New York, which is you know, December, January, February. So, okay, I have a question because if we were to kind of look at the way you have your room set up, like, for instance, like, obviously I have multiple species that I keep, but obviously I have stuff that wants to be cooler than other stuff, right? So I have certain stuff on the bottom. Where do you keep your boas? Like, where are your boas compared to uh, the other stuff that you keep? And, you know, or, or what, where, where did you used to keep them with all the other stuff that you used to keep? I'm curious. Well, I keep them all in the same building. I mean, I only have one big warehouse where I keep everything. So they're all in the same building in the same climate. Um, The ball pythons, the boas, the blood pythons, the tree pythons. 
Um, the only thing I do differently is the colubrids, which are North American, they hibernate and I keep them in my office, which gets cold in the winter. So, right. you know, they're all in the same exact environment. And I only breed, I, I've learned, here's a perfect example. I used to have a, a bunch of Boland's pythons. Yeah. But my warehouse is way too hot for Boland's pythons, way right. too hot. Even right. 75 is too hot for them. You know, your, your office would probably be better for that, for bowling. Right. But then even in my office at a certain time of year, it was too hot, you right. know? So they just didn't do well. And I ended up selling all of them. It's something I'd like to get back into again, but they were just burning through calories. Those snakes just burning through calories. And it wasn't, wasn't conducive of them thriving and breeding. So, yeah, I figured I was better off getting getting rid of them. So what I've done now is I just keep the animals that I know are going to do well in the environment that I've created, and that for me is boas and pythons mostly. You know, yeah, it's 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 crazy how big of an adjustment certain species of pythons really like. I mean, like they, I mean, I guess most of them could live with it and, and and deal with it, but I mean, does the average keeper know that that snake's burning all those calories? and whatnot you know i think when the breeder or or i think when a breeder or even keeper knows that what they're doing isn't right is when they try to breed it and they're very unsuccessful at it you know what i mean because like you know uh, things with the bullens that's been the number one snake that that's like the, the unicorn snake as far as trying to get to breed right um yeah well i got them to breed and i've gotten them to to lay eggs but none of them hatched so right you know it was again it was just too hot it was too 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 m- much of a warm climate for them and they're high altitude animals. So I came to the conclusion of I'm either going to put all my eggs into the boa basket or I'm going to get rid of all my boas and just keep a pair of Boland's pythons, <laughs> which wouldn't be enough money to make a living on. So. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like if maybe if you're uh, a retired fucking millionaire or some shit and you just got money just coming in elsewhere, then Maybe just go with the Bullens, but even but we're talking about your boas here, man. So that's that's not that's not, that's not an easy, easy decision. I mean, it's a lot easier to get Bullens versus to get the shit that you've done with the boas. So that you did the right thing, bro. Obviously, um, but yeah, you gotta you gotta pay some bills too, right? At the end of the right. day, what you, what you keep is not something that uh, is just generating itself or paying itself off. Uh, well, actually, it is in a sense. But um, you know, I'm curious, how many Bullen clutches did you end up having that didn't make it? I'm I'm, I'm just what I have to have to ask you. If you Twice I, I saw <clears throat> stuff going on. So, wow. Okay. Um, now, going back to the whole having you having success with the same female, um, and what I mean by that, anytime you have a repeat pairing going on, um, most of that comes from. Well, first and foremost, Vin, you do give your your females a year off, right? Like after they lay, do they get the next year off? Or are you able to get them back up? And going where they could go simultaneously, like every year. I, I'm, I'm just curious. What, which ones, boas or? Oh yeah, boas, boas. Mm-hmm. Well, all all the boas I have, the Imperator, um, and the and the Sigma will all go every year. Um, the most I've had was seven years straight with a a Cocker K boa. Um, mm-hmm. But the constrictor, the true red tails, they, they will not go every year. They, they don't, they, they, they are spring breeders. So their babies are born later in the season. So there's not enough time for them to eat enough food to breed again. So constrictor go every other year. Um, and the, the imperator will and can go every year. But if I don't, if I'm going to skip them a year, I don't put them into a feeding seasonality. I just, trickle feed them and wait if if i feel that they didn't gain enough weight after giving birth but they can go every year whether or not i i do is is a whole nother thing but if they're healthy and they're out they're eating they'll they'll go every year so ideally if we could kind of if you could walk us through how you would suggest um anyone getting a female back back on its feet correctly because i mean you have people who like to get oh because like for instance I remember I told you that I was feeding my female throughout the whole time versus to like the last few weeks. Um, and, and at the time I was told that it, it was almost kind of like, well, yeah, pe- that's what people do. Like they, you're supposed to do that. Right. And then I asked you, I said, do you, after your female ovulates, do you continue to feed them? And you said, no, correct. 
Correct. I don't feed them. I don't feed them once I see them breeding. They don't. Right. They don't feed. My my boas don't feed from December till they give birth, which is June, six months. So I just don't feed them. That's just the way I do it. A lot of people don't agree, but works for me. <laughs> Good. I mean, is there people that you know that have had more success? feeding the boas after ovulation um and that's why they're giving you shit or I, i'm just curious i don't understand where, where where the where the where that gap is because i mean first and foremost you know i i with any python species i've ever had success with after they ovulate they want nothing to do with food you could dangle whatever the fuck you want uh you know they'll wrap it at the at best case but they're not going to eat it you know what i mean um i had this boa eating and and, and mind you there were small smaller meals but um she was eating and i was like holy shit and so, you know, I don't know. It's just like, you know, there's so many things to do, I guess. But I, I always look to find the, what's better for the animal, Vin. That's all I'm looking for, you know. Well, you know, boas are opportunistic feeders. They're unlike, um, unlike pythons, they have a, a very different natural history. So they're more of an opportunistic feeder. So they will eat. But the problem that you will run into if you're feeding a boa when it's gravid is that if there's a lot of um, stool left in its, it's yeah, urates, its system and it's trying to pass babies. Yeah. It's not sometimes you can't get the babies around that. So, you know, in, in, in nature, that snake least likely will run into a meal because when it's gravid, it, it, it'll, it'll seek heat. It'll find a place to, to hide it's not going to be ambushing prey. So, it, it, you know, in captivity, you're putting a rat right in front of it. So is it going to take it? Yeah, it's going to take it. Right. But in the wild, it's not seeking food. So it's not going to eat in the wild while it's grabbing. I guess boas are just on that level of like, fuck it. I'll keep eating if you're going to give it to me. You know, yeah. just, that's yeah. why people aren't very successful with boas because they feed them way too much. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you just have certain species that are going through the same thing. They could just like ball pythons, for instance, you know, they could deal with it to a certain extent. Right. But I mean, ball pythons are something where, I mean, even if you do make slight adjustments and even, I don't know, like, like uh, uh, with your ball python production, which when was the last time you produced a ball python? I make hundreds of ball pythons. Every you year. still, you're okay. I thought you stopped. Okay. I apologize. Oh, no. You're still racking out ball pythons. How come I feel like I've never seen ball pythons at your table? Because the guy next to me and the guy next to me and across from me has thousands of them, so I don't bring that's, them. <laughs> that's why I just maybe assumed because every – like, mind you, man, I, I – and if anyone doesn't know the story, like, one of my first Tinley experiences um, were – and this is right after I had inquired a, uh, a blood boa from someone else who had it – who got it from you. But anyways, I uh, – <laughs> Come, I come across this table not even knowing it's Vin, and I'm just looking at all these boas, and I'm talking to him. We're going back and forth for like 20 minutes, and then I ask for his business card, and uh, I read it, and I'm like, holy shit. Wait, I look at you. I'm like, Vin Russo, what? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that I'll never, I'll take that story to my grave, man. It, it was very iconic. Um, but, yeah, I don't remember seeing that one freaking ball python at your table throughout the last three years that I've come and visit. And, and that's because – other people just have ball pythons at their tables. That's what it is. Yeah. Well, why am I going to bring ball pythons when um, there's a thousand people selling ball pythons? I'll bring boas. That's what I'm known for. You know, the ball pythons for me are, you know, they're fun. I still do them, but I wholesale most of those out. I mean, I, I rarely retail them now. Um, to me, they're just, um, they just help pay, pay the bills. And, and, and you know, there's always, and I would say one of the biggest topics of the end of the last year and this year so far is like there being a recession within the industry and, and whatnot. I mean, how are you doing with the wholesale of things? I mean, are your ball pythons still selling how they've always sold or what's going on with that? I don't have any ball pythons left from, from 2022 production. So they sold fine. But again, I deal with a lot of wholesalers that'll buy 10 and 20 lots of things. So um, it, it's, it is what it is. You know, I, I love ball pythons. I've been doing them for 35 years. I, I produced the first leucistic ball ever in history, the blue-eyed 
Russo. Wow. What year was that? That was in 2000. So 23, 23 years ago. And um, it kind of put me on the map in a way. And I, and I love the bolt and I'll always have those in my collection. You know, I, that's what I predominantly make now. Leucistics, I make my Ultramels, I make Tides. I love albinos still, even though they're not worth as much. I still make a bunch of those, um, you know, stuff like that. I just, and I just wholesale them out. I mean, so, a, a beautiful all white snake is always going to do well. You know what I mean? And, and it may not do like relevant, relevantly a high end well, but I'm saying like a couple hundred, 300, like that's going to be a snake that's going to go no problem. Right. Because it's, it's just, it's just a beautiful cool snake it's an all-day pet snake for anybody who's either just young or curious or whatever it just because my buddy bill stiegel works with primarily um bells when in his ball python projects because it, it's something that's just so lucrative it just boom he makes them gone makes them gone and uh so you know that's one thing you gotta love about the ball python game uh, you could enjoy it and not have to be a part of the rat race if you right you know. i don't want to be the guy who makes the next you know Shimmy sham, shimmy yeah. sham. <laughs> yeah, clown and she head for legs. That doesn't matter to me. Head for legs. Yeah. Uh, hey, going back to some of the like surrealness of what's happening tonight, um, because you know one of my biggest mentor in YouTube all around, but literally just sitting down and interviewing, talking to people, somebody that like groomed me without even knowing that he was grooming me was somebody that we both know. You've been on his show more than once. I know that. Um, but good old Brian Cusco. Uh, what's up, Brian? How you doing, buddy? Um, but you know, I, I don't know. Do you remember your first podcast, Vin? Do you remember when the first time you sat down and you spoke to somebody and what year that was? I'm just curious. I don't, I, I'm wondering how long you've been doing this for as far as speaking to people about your stuff. Well, I used to have my own show. It was called, um, Herp what? Nation's Cutting Edge Herp Radio. Yeah. When was this? That was in, um, 2010. 2010 i never knew about that solo dolo did you have a co-host what, what was going on well what it was was a guy named uh, scott waters had a, a magazine called herp nation and he started a podcast called herp nation and it what he had me on it once and then we had my own show called cutting edge herp radio and and what i did was all of the guests i had at that time were academics because the big thing back then was was to do a, a podcast or a radio show with b breeders talking to each other. So right. I wanted to be the breeder that was going to talk to the scientists that oh. knew about, you know. So my, my first guest on that show was Dr. Scott Boback, who was um, a Ph.D., who got his Ph.D. Uh, dissertation on on dwarf boas from islands. So we talked about that. I think I did two two episodes with him. I had um, a, a few herpetologists on. I've had I, it's again. It's a long time ago. And when Herp Nation, well, Herp Nation magazine went out of business, he kind of started weaning off the the Herp Nation Herp Radio show. Wow. Nick Mutton was also a host on that show too. He had his own show. So that's you know more than thirteen years ago. <laughs> that's crazy and, and and all these episodes were available on a website or how, how are they were but once once they all got lost i, I don't know what happened to them I'm, that's crazy i want to try all and get them episodes. back you know all those episodes how many hours do you think's gone oh shit i think we had 14 episodes and each one was like three hours Dude, imagine YouTube disappearing and taking all this shit. That would be crazy. It would be gone forever. Yeah. I mean, that's that. I mean, I don't see how that can't be possible. All it takes is the wrong leader or some shit, and they just say, fuck it. Don't all it can take is one, one uh, server to go down. <laughs> Damn. Scary to think. Um, yeah. I mean, since we're on this topic, what, what would you say the most iconic episode you that stands out in your head? Like, one, if it's one episode you wish you could go and grab and put out for all the people nowadays. What would you think? What would you say that number one episode was? You know, I did a, a great show with um, with my brother. Wow! Because <laughs> my brother described uh, Lon Jakarta with Doctor Price, so I'd, I'd like to get that one back. You know, older or younger, your brother? My brother's older, yeah. And he doesn't keep no more, or, or what's his? What's no, his he doesn't even keep reptiles. Yeah. Period. He doesn't at all. No. Never. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> um 
let's kind of talk about some of the exciting stuff here, uh, Ben, that you're going to be having displayed and, and maybe some stuff that not too many people even know that you're going to have. I mean, because I think people need to understand that when it comes to Tinley's, right? Like if you're right, it is majority of a goddamn ball Python fest, nothing against anyone out there, but if no. you want to, if you want to see something unique, you want to see something that typically no one else has, it's going to be this guy's table, cutting edge herbs. But I want to hear it from you, man. Like, what are some of the stuff that you're most excited to be displaying at Tinley next weekend? Well, I'm excited. I'm going to bring a bunch of really, really good blood boas because I've come to the conclusion that I think I've saved enough by now. <laughs> I've been making them for 20 years and uh, they've been getting better and better and better. And every year, I produce a litter of them. I'm like, oh, I got to keep all those. Oh, I got to keep all those. <laughs> now I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start selling a bunch of the real good ones. So um, I started doing it already. And um, I'm going to bring some really good hypo bloods, some bloods, maybe maybe some yeah. Nicaraguan bloods from a, another bloodline I have. So that that I'm excited about because it, it you know it took me a long time to get them to this to the, to be this red. You know, and, and um, to me, it's like even if somebody wants to buy one to add into a project, you're in you're instantly injecting red into a project, you know, so. Right. And, and the thing that you've done is just keep putting your highest quality red back into the highest quality red and just over right. and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and, and like I said, it's like a goddamn laser beams hitting your table. When I walk by it, it's, it's like you can't help but to look. Um what makes you go with purple background on the paper? I'm curious. Um, well, it's more like a bluish purple. It's hard to explain. Yeah, but but, but what it does is, you know, um, I'm, I'm into koi. I have a, a koi garden in my yard. I've got really big Japanese koi. Uh, I want when that. I go to, when I go to the koi shows, all of the fish are displayed in blue, purpley, blue-bottomed tubs. Okay. So it brings out the it, it gives you visual contact of the the colors the best way. So it's like a bluish purpley background. It's again, it's just construction paper that, that you can buy for your kids third grade class. I just Easy. cut it into little squares and put it into my into my displays. But I got the idea from koi shows where they display the koi in these bluish purplish tubs so you can see the, the perfect colors of the fish. Same with snakes. I don't know if you know this, Vin, but I vended my first show recently in January. Um, it was cool, you know, but it was too cool. What I mean by that, nobody fucking told me to bring heat wire or anything like that. It was goddamn freezing in that facility, man. And and, and honestly, like, it is scary, bro. Like, I mean, wh when do you feel like you really had a grasp on vending? Like, and what I mean by that, like, when did you stop freaking out over what temps were inside the building or are you somebody who likes to take their animals into the hotel room? Like I, I'm just, I have to pick your brain about the vending side of things because it was fun, but I'm also kind of scared to ever take animals back ever again. I'm not going to lie. Well, when I, when I put the animals in the display cases that the, they are getting some heat from above okay. because I use incandescent light bulbs. So they are getting heat um, and, and they do warm up during the day. And at night I put them away into styrofoam boxes as if I'm shipping them so that they stay warm in the boxes. I don't leave them out on display. I see lots of guys who just cover up their display with a with a, a sheet and walk away. But if it gets 60 degrees in that building that night, those snakes are going to get cold. I mean, yeah, I mean, even with the fucking sheet. I mean, I, I had thick, like, you know, extra, like, uh, tablecloth and, like, you know, stuff to put over. But I'm like, that's not going to do much. Like, No, it's, they're not generating it, heat. To, yeah, uh, to stay in there. It's fucking cold. And then I remember even feeling them by the end of the day, and I'm like, oh hell no, I'm not leaving you here. Um, and so you know, I think it's just kind of like a rookie, rookie jitters you need to get out and whatnot. And, and but I, I I do know that, you know, man, I, I got people I really respect in the game who are just veterans at vending, and you got people who go all over the country vending, and it's like, God bless you, man. Like you must fucking you must got that shit down. Um well, but did you ever notice that I've never brought a green tree python or an Amazon basin boa to a show either? They, to me, they can't handle that. That's I don't put, but, putting them in a box and then putting them in a cup and then putting them on display and then putting them in a box. But but, hold, good. but but let's pause there, Vin, because listen, if it's one thing I hope I could ever be someday, even though I'm talking this shit right now, I would 
I would like to someday be that Rico Walder at a show. He did. Well, it. even even Rico Walder rarely brought snakes to shows. I mean, he has table. He has pics of tables just covered full of chondros. I remember seeing that. Uh, well, he also did things where there was a few guys bringing stuff too. So, but yeah, he, 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 was, he did have a crew. He always had a yeah. crew. Of people. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Imagine that, man. I mean, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, bro. I, Vin, I like going to these shows. But it's more of a, it's 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 more of a job now, man. I'm not gonna lie, and and and, and, and I don't it doesn't feel like a job, but really, I'm getting paid to go fly and do these interviews at these shows, and I look forward to just doing the interview and doing that. But like, I don't have an ambition of okay, what snakes are at these tables? You know what I mean? Because at at, at the most, I mean, I fucking love shits like what's behind me. Um, I just noticed that. There aren't no good looking arboreal snakes at these shows anymore at all. Like, and it and if there is an arboreal snake there, it's it's in a deli cup shoved and it just got off the boat, like just got here. Right. Um, and, right. and and like, yeah, I, I and I don't blame why people don't want to take their stuff. I mean, I like like I said, I would I wouldn't, I I wouldn't, no, not at all, not right now, but I, I would hope someday I have it down, I guess I could say, and I could be that guy to where I'm like, none, none of this shit's for sale. But you know what I mean? Um, look at it. Don't touch. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, well, you know, I, I've been doing conjures a long time and I, I don't like I just don't like bringing them to shows. To me, they're a little delicate. Um, and if you notice, the, the, like you just said, the, the, the guys that are serious about conjures really don't bring them to shows. They don't have to. I don't have to bring a conjure python to a show because they sell in seconds. I mean, elsewhere, a few phone calls and you can sell the, the good ones really quick. So there's no reason to bring them to shows. And, and I'm like you, I don't like doing the shows. I don't like the, <laughs> the pressure of, of packing up animals and worrying about their well being and bringing them all the way to another state. And, you know, I, I don't like being the, the guy who's, who does it. Cause I see guys at shows that, They'll be in Pennsylvania one weekend. They'll be in Tinley Park the next weekend. It yeah. looks like they didn't even take the snakes out of the box. You know? I, honestly, I think about that. Because, yeah. okay, you know, hustle, but what's your quarantine process like after each show? Because it doesn't look like you have one. Right. I mean, it doesn't even look like they leave the display case. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, but that's like the hustle behind what that is. I mean, I don't all due respect, man. Like you have people who just solely rely on their ball python productions. And you have people who are used to having two clutches, but we're not in the 200 anymore right now. And, um, you know, especially if you have mid to, you know, like mid range stuff, like people are either all in or they're not like, it's, it's weird right now. It's a kind of a weird place. In, but I got to tell you, man, I, 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 my heart goes out to anyone who has, um, just thousands of ball pythons that they just hatched out over the last couple of years and, and they're just sitting on them. You know what I mean? Because that's fucking work, man. Like that's either way, once a week, either way, that's a lot of work. You feel, I always thought it was good to be, but I don't know. How many litters overall are you looking to hit this year? You think best case scenario, I have to ask you, Vin, how many litters are you looking to get? I usually don't disclose how many litters I'm going to have. Usually, but we're on. Come on, it's come on. Coolest reptile podcast in the world, Vin. Give us, give us like, a, <laughs> give us like a ballpark, buddy. We don't, we don't need the exact number. Um, you know, if you don't mind, come on, like, let's, let's give us a little idea. A lot of people listening that want to know that information. Well, how about this? Is <laughs> is the number staying average? Meaning, are you going higher each year, or is it going lower each year? Can we talk about that? No, I'm I'm going I'm going lower because uh, at one point. I was much, much bigger than I am now. I had a much larger warehouse and, you know, a lot more animals produced, a lot more overhead. You know, there was years where there was hundreds of ball python clutches, close to 100 boa litters, um, hundreds of um, corn snake and bull snake and pine snake and king snake clutches. Um, it was just too much. It, it got to be to the point where I hum, it wasn't humanly possible for me to keep up with it. So, you, you know, the way I look at it is I've got to I've got to do all the breeding and the feeding 
And if it gets to the point where I, I can't handle it, I'm not going to do it. So I, I scaled yeah. things back in 2017, scaled things back to like, you know, half of what I was doing. And, um, and I'm like a one man show. I do most of the work myself. So you're, you're, you confidently just said that there was at one point over a hundred litters you were doing with boas by itself at one point. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Um, I guys, listen, I, I do want to say, I knew, I knew this guy was going to be fashionably Dave late, um, <laughs> but he's fresh, man. This guy's fresh. He's here. I do need you guys to get the likes up. We are just shy of 90 people in the fucking building. Thank you so much for everyone who's tapping in, but it's just really now about to get going because with us, we have <laughs> <laughs> the man. Dave Levison, what's <laughs> up, buddy? <laughs> Sorry, I still can't figure out this Eastern and Central time thing, and that's my fault. Hey, I was man. all on schedule; everything was going perfect. I got out of the building 15 minutes too late. It was an hour and 15 minutes too late. So, <laughs> hey, hey, Ben, check this out. Okay, so I mean, guys, anyone out there, God bless you. Unfiltered Reptiles podcast is on hiatus, but it will come back. But I had the, the 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 blessings of the podcast gods to have Dave as a co-host for a few episodes, and I got to tell you, before we even got started, Dave was man was he was he his best hype man. He was like, "Hey, buddy, you know," he's like, "Just just so you know, like I'm I'm damn good at this," and uh, and I'm like, so good at this. I'm like, I'm ready to go, man. No problem." And I'm like, "Okay." So we, I tell him, "All right, we got an East Coast guest." I tell him the time, and I'm like, "Hey, buddy." <laughs> We're going live here in 30 minutes, and he's like, oh, isn't there a four-hour difference time between East and West Coast? I'm like, what? <laughs> four hours? And that's how that all started from there, man. But, Dave, you're here, buddy. I'm glad you're here. It doesn't matter. Late, Later, early, Dave Levison in the building, and you look great. I got to say, you look great. You look you look a reason why you're late. It looks It paid off, I got to tell you. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's been – I mean, I'm going to pull out the $5 tux if I'm going to be talking to Vin. <laughs> well, I've got a feeling he doesn't have any pants on. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> See? <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Damn it, Vin. Why'd you have to say that right now, buddy? Oh, man. Well, That's Dave. Funny. Dave, listen, there's no way in hell I could have done this episode without you. So I got to say thank you for being here, buddy. I know you got a lot going on with all your day-to-day -day work. You're a busy guy, Tinley right around the corner. But, man, this is our episode, buddy. Why don't why, why don't you kind of hit Vin with some stuff here? What do you got on your mind? We got Vin Russo round two. Let's talk about it. Well, if you don't mind, not to change that, but what did I jump in on? Is there a conversation happening? Like maybe I'll just trickle in in a second. I can't. You know, I'm, I'm a little startled right now. I'm honest, man. Things are happening real fast. I didn't even get a glass of water yet. So, okay, if you want to, that's fine. But Ben was just about to tell us how many litter boas he's going to have this year. Go ahead and tell us, Ben. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. No, he wasn't. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. No, no, no. no but seriously, my, my our, our topic as of right now is where Ben's at with his productions. Like, is he going – is he – going more each year is he going down and he was just explaining how the numbers are going on the lower side versus the higher side with his boa productions well how about this Finn? um let's just say 20 boas go for you this year you gonna breed that same 20 next year or do you give your girls a year off we, we were talking about that um, we talked about that. Uh -huh. the imperators <laughs> the imperators can go every year the constrictors cannot go every year so yeah and, you know, not every Imperator will go every year. The smaller ones will because it doesn't take much to get to bounce them back. You know, all the island type snakes and the the Nicaraguan and the blood boa stuff and the even the well, the Sigma, the leopard boa stuff. They're smaller. So they they can bounce back pretty easily. So they will go every year. But Constrictor yeah. will not go every year. I agree with that. We do the same thing here. Um how do you feel about the Sigma stuff, man? I feel like everything's getting real exciting. I'm starting to see more mutations. Um, I know there's stuff going on overseas where they're actually working with pure T negatives now, it sounds like. Uh, we recently saw a couple of guys post some T positives. Can somebody please break down Sigma? Any could, Just for any – because, like, I, I'm not going to lie. I, please, somebody tell anyone out there what that is, please. Well – what happened was in 2016, uh, a, a group of herpetologists uh, sequenced the DNA on a, a large um, 
a large group of snakes. They've collected snakes and snake data and skins from breeders such as myself from uh, Mexico all the way down to South America. And what they did was they figured out through the DNA sequencing that there were certain, um, um, I guess, alleles and gene markers of snakes that they, they boiled it down to three species now. It used to be nine subspecies. Now they boiled it down to three species. So from the Isthmus of T Tijuana Peck all the way up to the Sonora Desert, that's um, Sigma, Boa Sigma. Are they, are they on your, uh, where are they at on your page? Um, uh, all leopard boas are Boa yeah. Sigma. All Tara Homara mountain boas are Boa Sigma. So this um, is a leopard. So this is Sigma. No, no, that's a blood boa. Damn it. <laughs> I, I suck. Uh, no, this, no, that, that is crazy looking. Is that what is that's a, that's an onyx boa. That's a hypo oh onyx, head, blood and head T positive. So, wow. I, so with the onyx project, so I know there's been a lot of arguments on that. Is it what you consider its own project completely unrelated to leopard? Or is it kind of like how we have a CA motley and we have a, um, Argentine Motley, and we have a Colombian Motley. Is it the same virtual thing? It's all compatible, just different. Well, it, it to me, it's different from Leopard Boa because it, the you know what it reminds me of. It reminds me of like lesser platinum balls and Russo balls. They make a white snake or a whitish snake, but when you breed them to other things, they make different things. You know what I mean? So, for okay. example, um, if you bred a an onyx boa or a super onyx boa to a leopard, you will make something that looks like a leopard, but it won't have as much pattern. It's not as pretty as a leopard, and it's not as pretty as an onyx. It's somewhere in between. But mm -hmm. So it is an allelic trait, but I still keep them separate because they make different things. So, for example, when you breed the onyx into a uh, motley and you make a motley onyx it's called the sumaton it's it's got all these wacky you know patterns and stripes and stuff in leopard they call it what a blackberry and they blackberry. call it a, a eclipse yeah. you know so, so we're gonna jump around on this because i've had this conversation a million times from back robin that um so here's the thing. So early on with the leopard stuff, a lot of us thought that we could pick out our hats. Um, a year went by where I think um, Warren Booth had picked out ones that were pos hat for, or based on markings and pattern, and it did not prove out hats. Um, now with this project, we're talking more super. We're not talking recessives. So is it the same? Ba like they're both recessives then. Am I wrong? No, because the onyx, you can pick out the onyx. So the onyx is the single the single gene. The super onyx is the double gene. So the super onyx is the homozygous, um, and the onyx is the het, in a way. But the okay. onyx has like a grayish, darkish cast to it. So yeah. like you can pick them out. They're pretty they're like they're like a, a dark boa, you know? That's why they call so, onyx. It means black. So I do feel like, again, you know, with the Leopard Project, people thought they could pick out their heads. Now, right. first we're going to talk in, oh, yeah, how about this? If I bred an onyx to a leopard, would I make a bunch of black snakes? You would make things that look like leopards and things that look like look like something between a leopard and an onyx. They would, they would have that solid eye look. They would have scrambled pattern. Um, but that's why I'm saying it is a lila. They do make similar looking things. But when you breed a leopard to a motley and you breed an, a super onyx to a motley and you, you, you cross back, you, you get two different things. Yeah, they don't look the same. They are definitely different. Um, but I guess my cool comment was if one's considered a recessive and we're not considering the other one a recessive, but it's a lelic, does that work genetically? It, it does because I, I have a feeling that even with leopard, you know, a lot of people will argue with you that leopard is incomplete dominant because they could pick out heads. But I agree with, with you. I've, I've pulled out what I thought were, were het leopards from, you know, head to head readings. 
you know, possible heads which I that had markers and raised them up and bred them to leopards. And never they never made leopards. So it's like you can't always go by that. Then then there may be something different that, that we'd have to look for as far as the hats, but you know who knows? Who knows? Yeah. So I, I guess the reason I've had this conversation a lot of times is, you know, sometimes I have the argument when like you know, it happens in the ball python community a lot. We'll get the exact same mutation 10 years later. We'll relabel it a completely different name. We'll see combos we didn't see before, and we'll pay $10,000 a piece for something that's selling for $50. So in this project, I guess my thing early on was with this argument or this conversation we're having now was, was it portrayed that way because it wanted to have a higher value by saying it was something different compared to saying it was the same in a sense? You know what I mean? Well, I, I'm going to give you another example, and I'm going to use the ball pythons again, and I'm going to use the the Russo and the um, the platinum. The Russo, if you threw a, a normal het, well, we'll call it a het Russo, into a pile of normal balls, some of them might be hard to pick out as a as a visual head, even though to me they they have a visual head indicator. But if you took a platinum or a, plat a platy daddy and threw it in a pile of normals, it's going to stick out like a turd in a punch ball. But yet they both do the same thing. They both make a white animal. And when you breed them to each other, they make a white animal too. So that's See, why no, part Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, th that's why I'm saying even with this, with this onyx, where an onyx boa, one gene bred to a normal, Half the babies will be onyx. You will be able to pick them out. Onyx to onyx, you will make one and four will be a super onyx. A leopard to a normal boa, you're going to make all hets. And you might not be able, well, they'll, they'll all have some kind of indicator on them, you know, but it won't be as obvious. Okay. And I understand that. Like I said, I... I've battled with Mac Robinette for a long time because, like I said, I feel like in this industry over the years, sometimes we just like to rebrand something when we're trying to make it a little more profitable. Um, and again, with the argument of this being a Lelic, not a Lelic, so on and so forth, I just don't think I got all the information on it. But again, Mac Robinette, extremely informative because he invested in the project. And I'm not taking anything away from it. And I do believe in keeping things pure. So if I had it, I wouldn't even want to cross them anyways, personally. No, and I'm definitely not going to mix them into any of my leopard stuff. But here's the number one reason why. The number one reason why is those onyx boas are, for, excuse me, are from Honduran boas that are very small, and they make a T positive that has nothing to do with the Nicaraguan T positives over here. So yeah. it's like, why would I want to dilute that? You know. So you've got that whole T positive part of it, which to me is like worth its weight in gold. So I believe it was somebody overseas a few years ago. Did they breed? Was it a CAT positive to a Honduran or Costa Rican? And when they made the double visual, it almost looked like a T negative. Yeah. They, they, they bred a Nicaraguan, the Tom Burke Nicaraguan T positive to a Onyx Honduran T positive. Well, not necessarily an Onyx, but a T positive from that Honduran line. They made double hets. It was not, it's not a Lelic. You're not going to hit anything the first generation. But when they bred them to each other, they made um, what they call angels. And they look like a T negative albino. Yeah. The double, the double homozygous Tom Burke T positive and the Honduran T positive. Yeah. And, I, think I, I remember seeing that. I thought it was unique because, again, it took you to a T negative almost phase of an animal because they started canceling out different colors in each right. other. Right. It's like the it's like the Camarillo ball python. It's um it's caramel, which is a type of T positive, and it's ultramel, which is a type of T positive. So, so I have a pair of caramellos. Should I breed them? Do you work with your caramel stuff anymore? The Camarillos, the females are just like a caramel. You will get maybe one egg good and a bunch of slugs. Okay. So, so now uh, okay. 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 I have a question, Ben, because I'm curious about these lines behind albinos. T positive, more importantly, because you know, on the picture we were just on, it said Hond Het Honduran T positive, right? T positive right. albino. 
Uh, and and, and it, that's something that's only worked with another Honduran team. Like that, li those lines have to go together, correct? Well, I, as a purist, I like to keep them together. Yeah, but I've I've mixed them into the blood bow because the guy that originated it did it too. Frank uh, in Holland did it. Frank Nort, he uh, bred one of my blood hypo bloods into his T positive Honduran, and made hats and then bred them back and made the uh, the blood T positive Honduran and the blood T positive Honduran Onyx and Super Onyx. So do you feel like, I don't remember this purist community the way it is now. Um, I feel in the boa community that this purist community really kind of came up about five or six years ago, like these diehards, don't mix them. It's got to be all from um, Costa Rica. Otherwise, don't bother. Um, don't bring bloods into it, whatever else. Where did this come from? Has this been developing for a while and I just didn't notice it? Or did it kind of develop overnight? No, it's been around forever. <clears throat> Specifically, it was more prevalent in Europe. That's why I did so well in Europe back in the early 2000s and the mid 2000s. I was I was going to Europe every year selling stuff because people wanted to buy the pure locality type bows, you know. Yeah. So, you know, and Europeans were more into the the wild type or locality type things, so they would sell better there. But now they sell even better here, so I don't even bother going over there anymore. Interesting. So it's our market developed a little later than their market, and they kind of got the ball rolling for us in a sense because a lot of stuff we're working with now, we ended up importing for Europe. Right. People people are starting to understand the true value of – and also keep in mind, these animals don't come out of the wild anymore too. So it's like the only place to get them is, is in captivity now. Well, I'm not hating on it by any means. I actually love the shit out of it. Um, you know, like I said, I have a lot of really great conversations with Mac about this, Warren Booth. Um, you know, it's definitely got my attention. Um, you know, I've always been kind of a Colombian guy just because, but I have picked up a couple of animals from a couple of different projects because of talking to Mac Robinette about it. Right. <clears throat> so but that's me. But um so what have we talked about? You guys talked about your food cycling. You guys I want, talked I want, about. I want to talk about this steak though. Hold on. I, I want to talk about. Go. I want to talk about what's happening here, um, Ben, because you dropped this towards the end of last year, and I don't know if this is something that you have going on. Um, like, do you make a lot of these at this point, or what's what's the story behind this project? I'm curious. This snake you put, that you got on the screen right here now. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. <clears throat> that snake is. What I did was many years ago, probably 2008, I bred a salmon boa, a really nice red salmon boa to a leopard boa. And I made, now salmon is incomplete dominant. So half the litter was hypo. I made hypos had leopard and normals had leopard. <clears throat> Those hypo had leopards, I bred back to hypo sonoran leopards. Because at the same wow. time I was breeding leopard into hypo my pure hyposonora line. So I made hyposonoran pure sigma leopards and I bred those into the salmon het leopards and I made that snake there. And I have a bunch of those and they're breeding right now. And I made some last year and I'll make some this year. And that's a male that's very colorful. And I've got a few that are similar to that. Some maybe redder, some more orange, but there are no two look exactly alike. And I think the reason why they got those colors mm -hmm. is because they've got hyposonora, they've got salmon hypo, which is two incomplete dominant hypos, and leopard. And they're predominantly sigma because I've bred them back into sigma for three generations now. So, so and I'm going to have two questions about this because I'm going to add something I never really thought about before. And then also... From what we know with the salmon gene or with the salmon hypo, we believe the original animal was a Panamanian hypo. Was exactly. that ever like it was for sure, or was that our yeah. assumption? No, we know. Okay. So now were you talking about mixing that hypo melanistic line that probably had heavy Colombian into it, in my yeah. assumption, um, into something with your Sonoran hypos? Now, what went into my head was when we crossed and started making the Sunset Project, when we started putting hog islands into hypomelanistic boas, reading them back and making the Sunsets. Now, are these two hypo lines working together in a sense where you could almost get a double dose of it by breeding them back together? 
That's what I think this is. I I think they're they're exhibiting the two hypo traits. I don't think <clears throat> I don't think the hypo to the hypo make a super hypo. Meaning, if you bred a hypo sonoran to a salmon hypo, you're not going to get a super form. But I think you're going to get animals with both that exhibit both hypos at the same time. Okay, so with the um, sunset boas. Is that a double super in a sense? Because I'd like to think that hog islands are a hypo type of gene that just became dominant over time, generation to generation in a small population. It could be. It could be. Because I've seen a lot of um, hog island crosses that are pretty light. You know, most, Believe it or not, most of the hog, hog island boas I see for sale today are crosses. I mean, it's very rare to find real ones. So... So they have rediscovered them in the wild, as far as I'm aware. And I believe yeah. the ones they're seeing now are a lot dirtier than the ones that we were getting in years ago or compared to what we have in the industry now. Well, a group of them came out of the, the, the wild in 2004. And I wrote about it in my book um, because they, did, they didn't come out of the off the islands legally. Somebody, somebody was going to the island collecting boas and bringing them to Honduras and Honduras and then shipping them to Florida. And at least one shipment got out because the guy got caught. Cause I know, I know two scientists that were working on that, those islands as part of the, um, a research team from a university. And, um, the guy got caught and it turned out he must've did it more than once or twice because <clears throat> I ended up buying some of those snakes in Daytona one year, a bunch of them. Because I knew, I, I figured out the story, and I and I heard about it. So those snakes I've bred, and they they are dark snakes. They're not light. They have a lot of speckling on them, which I like. You know, they they, they are true representatives of what's left on the island. But you got to keep in mind too. Back in the '80s and early '90s, well, late eighties, late eighties, maybe '90, um, they were almost collected to extinction, and they started collecting all the really light colored ones. So they probably left behind a few remnants of darker ones, and that's what's left on the island. So, but to me, they're beautiful. I mean, the colors they have, the orange on them, they're just amazing. So to me, that's representative of what's there. Um, I've always loved the Hog Islands, um, but as you know, it's really hard to trust anybody anymore. Um, and again, with the Hog Island boas, now you talked about how only X amount came off the island. Now, I thought there was a study where they went back and couldn't find anything in like five to 10 days of looking, and it was only recently that they rediscovered them. Is that well, right? Like yeah, what happened was in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, they were collecting them. In 1995, a bunch of guys went back there to look for them. They didn't find any. They went back like two or three times. They didn't find one. And it wasn't until like the early 2000s that they started finding them and they started pit tagging them. They pit tagged a hundred of them. Okay. Probably yeah. in like 2003. Cool. Now, the mountain boa. Can we talk about this project? Um, and why, why, why it's kind of like not more out there, I guess. I mean, I, this, this almost, I almost thought it was an Argentine boa at first, but it's not. Um, what's going on with this project here, Ben? How long have you been tapped into the mountain boas? I'm curious. I've been doing these since, um, Probably 1999. <laughs> what you know, the, first, the first group of them came into the country by some grad students that were doing research in the Tarahumara Mountains with uh, a school in, <clears throat> in Texas. And after they did their meristic studies, they ended up giving the animals to Gus Renfro. He bred them, and, and I bought animals from him back then, and I've been breeding them ever since. I'll tell you the reason why they're not as as popular and well they are popular the reason why they're not as prevalent is they own they're small snakes they only have six to ten babies that's it and if they go every other year you're lucky so i don't i don't make hundreds of them i make may make a dozen of them every other year but for the person who makes a lot of other stuff this would be such a cool project to have like i would love something like this like just and like they're, they're super small i mean the males are maybe three feet Females, a big one is not even five feet. Hmm. They're tiny snakes. I love and those it. are true sigma, boa sigma. 
I mean, you got a lot of people who won't cross over to boas because of the size of them. But there, I think a lot of people don't understand that there are species of boas where they don't get that big. Well, you know, we were talking about the onyx boas before, those Honduran boas. They're very small. <clears throat> they're, they are in comp – they're comparable to the size of these snakes. They're very small. I mean, they, they'll breed in little 28 core rubber made trays. They're small snakes. They'll have five babies, ten babies. Same as these. So there's lots of small races. A, my, a lot of my blood boas are very small. They're pure Central American. You're right. People people think of boa and they think of something big. It's funny because people will contact me and say, Vin, I want a boa that, that, that gets less than six feet. I'm like, well, almost all the ones I produced get less than six feet, you know? Yeah. So um, I do think that might be one of another reason why we're seeing more people kind of moving into these Hondurans, Costa Ricans, Nicaraguan stuff right now, CAs, is because, you know, I always say ball pythons get you in, you find something else you might love more, and then you transition over to it. So, you know, I find a lot of people already have the equipment, they have their cages, their CB70 tubs, and they want something new to put in there. And I do believe that a lot of these people that are buying into these smaller bows right now are doing it because... They have those rack systems. They've always wanted to work with boas, and they found one that can fit to what they have. Exactly, yeah. They, they'll breed in a CB70 tray. They're, they're, they're small snakes. I mean, I like to give them more room because they like to thermoregulate, um, but they could easily breed in a, in a, a CB70. I, like I said, I've bred those dwarf boas in 28 core rubber maids, which is small. 20, what are they, like 24 by 17 by 6 or something like that? Yeah, probably about that. Yeah. Um, I got a question. Um, so as of right now, like, what's your suggestion for people out there? Because, you know, anybody who like, let, let's put a scenario here, Ben. If I were at your table and I were to tell you, you know, I have T positive stuff. I just don't know what the line is. Um, are you, are you going to, are you not, excuse me, not convinced. That's a bad thing. But are you going to tell me how I need to just start fresh and do something pure and it's not worth mixing this stuff or like what, like what, what would you, what would you advise somebody who's new and, 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 and is excited to want to work with your stuff, but also already has other P like T positive stuff or blood stuff from elsewhere. I'm just curious. Well, you know, if they had other blood stuff, they could easily take a blood boa from my table and plug it into that and make bloods right out of the gate. That would be really red because the bloods that I've created now are very potent because they've been, they're almost a polygenic trait on top of a recessive trait. So that's one thing. As far as T positives, they need to know what they have. You know, there's in Central American boa wise, if it's, if it's a snake they bought in the United States in the last 10 years, it's most likely a Nicaraguan T positive, which originated from Tom Burke. So, okay. um, you know, so, you don't want to mix that into, you know, a, a, something that's not allelic with it. Right. No, and MJ might not know this, but um, MJ knows we're on St. Pierre, right? Oh, yeah. So you know. he brought in or he brought in the first Blood Boa Type 2 Aneurthristic and the uh, Motley Boa, right, for um, Colombians. Yeah, yeah, he did back in the, in the, in the early 90s. Yeah, and I think when he found the blood boa, he found the type two aneurysmic in the same bag or the same day going through some animals. The same, yeah, yeah the same, uh, the same imports. Yeah, that he well, he found three blood boas and I think two type two aneries and one patternless one, which popped up, you know, in 2015 in my in my collection, the patternless blood blood boas. So yeah. uh, not a pat. He didn't find a patternless blood boa, but he found a patternless El Salvador boa. And he, he also thinks he, and back then he found maybe some hypos and T-positives too. <laughs> so you don't mind if we keep talking boas for a minute, MJ, because I got more questions and I, I things I just don't know and I got to ask Finn. No, I was. I thought we could talk about why he doesn't sell more ball pythons. Of course, this is about the bro. Are you? This is what this is for. Please, okay. it's just okay. We're gonna go back to the small stuff. Hey Dave, 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 we need the likes to go up a little bit. Can you stand up real quick and just stand right back? I just need to stand up real quick. What's wrong with the lights? <laughs> just stand up. Oh, you just want it all, buddy? Ah, son of a bitch, man. This is Vid, man. We don't – want we just talk like this for a minute? <laughs> there we go. Continue, please. 
So, um, okay, the Super Stripe Project, buddy, like, the first animal, was that found in, like, an SPCA or, like, a surrendered animal with, like, zero background on it? It was, like, almost immediately bred into the Colombian stuff? Was that the Matt Jablonski? Yeah, line? the Jablonski line stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I wrote about it in my book, and I don't remember what I wrote, so. Well, then, let me, um, let me see what you said. Oh. <laughs> Wait, what book well, is that? We're going to talk about other stuff while I find it, but, um. I only ask because, you know, re I think just the other day there was a post on Facebook. I believe I sent it to you where the um, somebody made a um, BPIT positive uh, IMG hypo super stripe overseas. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, somebody made some IMG super stripes. And, you know, that's a project where I was lucky enough to get some animals from Matt uh, about a year ago. And I've been playing with them a little bit. But, you know, that's a project that I feel like I saw 15 years ago. And to this day in the United States, outside of like an albino and a sun glow, we just kind of skip by that project completely. And I just don't understand why. Yeah, I know another guy working on him, Anthony Lecompte. He was working yeah. on him, too. Yeah, Anthony got animals from him also. Um, right. I'll be honest, one of the animals that Anthony got, one of the females, I was really hoping to get myself um, to do essentially what he was going to do, but I wanted to put red rum tea positive into it, or the red rum BPIs. He was also looking to put BPIs into it. Um, I don't know, man. I Oh, uh, yeah, dude. I, I duct tape my phone up to do this. It's really sketched. I'm going to be playing with it a lot, but... Um, so, you know, that's a project that reminds me a lot of like the lab or the labyrinth boa, something yeah. that a lot of us are very obsessed over now. Um, you know, yes, it was harder to get there for a recessive, but, you know, I just look back at some of these boa genes and, you know, in our community, we have so little genes and it's like we just didn't put the effort into half of them. Um, the Marin project got no love. Um, I don't think I ever see anything for the Mandarin belly in the United States, and I find it hard to find overseas also. And I feel like there's a couple other diamonds in the rough that just kind of fell to the wayside, and I, I just don't understand why. Yeah, good question. Well, the one thing that happened with the um, Super Stripes is, um, at first, the Super Stripes were making, like, partially striped ones, too, you know? Yeah. So I think... At, at one point, they thought maybe it was incomplete dominant, you know, because it made some weird stuff. Um, I had gotten some animals from Anthony that were like those partially striped things and bred them to each other, and they didn't make any super stripes. Really? So it's like maybe at first we didn't know how it worked, whether or not it was truly recessive, and maybe for all we know, the, the ones we thought that were hats were not hats. Um, so there was some questions as to how it worked in the beginning and there may be still some questions i don't know i'll let yeah. you know honestly i've only made hats i've just been playing around with a very small group of animals putting them into as much stuff as i can right now but um you're right some of my het super stripes almost look better than some of what is said to be a visual super stripe right um you know another boa kind of lost in time that i haven't seen anything on in like seven or eight years was the um sangria boa hmm. uh, i think that was kind of that was a colombian blood type gene recessive yeah it, it, for all we know it could have been a blood we don't nobody knows okay yeah i think the last time i saw anything was a facebook post where somebody was breeding a sterling boa to a sangria boa i think it was a california breeder i can't remember his name outside of that i've seen nothing with that project either right Okay. You don't have to have the answers for everything, buddy. These are real questions I had because I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, you think about it for Dave Levinson to say he doesn't know something that's okay. fucking iconic. I mean, <laughs> it's the point of these conversations, man. No, I'm really good bullshitting. I might not know as much as you think. No, Dave, at the end of the day, you've been around the block, buddy, is all I'm saying. You've been around, you've had conversations about multiple things. So if there's something that you're some if there's something that you could talk about that you don't know about, I'm just glad to be here for is all I'm saying. This is like this is this is amazing. It's it's golden. I'll take that as a compliment. Um so Ben, <laughs> you got a great collection. Very extensive. You got a lot of cool things in there. 
do you still go out looking for new things? Like, do you still have that itch to go after like a Rosie Bow project for no reason? Like, you know, where are you at right now with your collection? Well, you know, you know what I did the last couple of years? Um, I started recollecting um, some more tree pythons because I used to have a lot of those. And I, and I used to make a bunch of them every year. And I, I did well with those. And um, that it kind of fell to the wayside because I was working with the OS High Yellows, which are not the most prolific, were not the most prolific snakes. They did make babies for me, and I did make plenty of them. But I realized that, for me, the wild-type tree pythons um, produced far better for me, and I started collecting more of those. And I noticed that with those... Um, they're a little more predictable with their breeding habits. And and now that the same thing happened to them that happened with boas, they've been, you know, it, but it's the opposite. Originally green tree pythons were thought to be one species, you know, one genus and one species, you know, Morelia viridis. And now it's four species. So I don't and understand that. <laughs> it, it makes so much sense to me now because I had all of them all this time. And um, yeah, those are some OS high yellows. Um, I had all of them all this time and, and they all acted differently. So now I'm starting to keep my Arus with my Arus, my Biox with my Biox, my you know, Sarongs with my Sarongs. And, and I'm starting to enjoy the beauty of the, the wild type tree pythons. So that's, that's something that I've been doing the last couple of years, you know. I even got some this year too. So man, next year I'll get some more, you know, different, different localities. Nice. Um, um, uh, hold on. I'm sorry. Time out. Uh, I, Cause I'm here to learn. Me. <laughs> um, Vin, you said Morelia Veritas. Ver, I'm sorry. That is Veritas. Right. And I remember me coming into the hobby. That's what I thought. That's what there were. That's the scientific term for them. But now you're saying there's five different ones. And is that the poultry and all the other ones that are, um, I, I just don't know the names, but I, I think I've heard them before. Well, I'll tell you, I've got it written down. All right. Go, Ben. <laughs> all right. You've got Morelia viridis, which are all the animals from, um, I guess, the southern part of the range. The northern part of the range are Morelia azurius uterensis. The animals from... Like Bioc are Morelia azuria, and the animals from the the western part of the range are Morelia azurius polker. So there's four different species now. So polcher, I knew it. That's the one that Gary talks a lot about. Gary Shavino, which yeah. you know Gary is obviously right. Yeah. So once that happened, I was like, wow, that makes so much sense because the animals from all those different parts of, of the, of their range act differently to me. And they look differently. A lot of them do, you know, Biox have a longer head. Um, you know, the Arus have a lot of blue in them, a lot of white in them. So you, you, you start, you start to see what, what, you know, these designer snakes that people have now, they're literally three way crosses, you know, and I'm not knocking them in any way. I wish I had some of those. Those are really nice snakes. Um, and some of the original OS high yellow stuff that I have definitely had Bioc in it because those snakes are big and they have big heads and they got big appetites. So it's like you, you, now that now that science has taken over that part of our industry, it's opened up my mind like, wow, here we are all this time we were breeding snakes and wondering why we were having trouble breeding two different species, you know, to each other. What's crazy to me is like, Vin has had his hands on almost everything, bro. It's nuts. Like you, you think Vin is just a boa guy, but no, that's not the case. He does a lot. Um, but what's crazy is like, just to think about what we're just breaking down the species behind these, these, these green tree pythons, because if correct me if I'm wrong, what out of those five that you just stated right now, uh, Vin? Four. Which what which one, four, I'm sorry, out of the four you just stated right now, which one of those are from the Australia? Like the because the, there, there's Australian chondros or or excuse me, chondros from Australia that are the bigger ones. Like they 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 are actually like the 
like the more fucking bolder ones out of out of out of all of them. Is that right? Those are Morelia viridis. They're, those are the the southern race. So okay. you know, snakes from Maruki, which is in the southern part of uh, Irian Jaya, and the snakes from the northern Cape York and Peninsula in Australia. Those are the same. While genotypically they're the same snakes, um, and they do get bigger, and you know they've got the green with the white dashes down the back, and the arus are green with white spots down the back. So um, yeah, that you know they're they're all the same thing. But try and find a, a real Maruki now; it's almost impossible. I mean, I don't, I have never, I haven't seen any. Probably since I think the Barkers had some back in maybe the late nineties. Hmm. They may still. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. So, about, go ahead. Oh, uh, you're good. I'm just, I'm, I'm okay. here. But this is your topic, man. You know more about this shit than I do. I got important stuff I want to talk about unless you do. Well, no, I was just going to make a comment on what he was saying, how, um, you know, I always say how the hobby always reinvents itself every decade, every five years. And, you know, science now, science is changing a lot. You know, you have guys that are purists that are now finding that all their shit is mutts in a sense. <laughs> and it's creating a completely new direction to go in for them because science has changed it for them. Well, that's what did it for me. It's like, here I was, Wondering why a lot of these breedings I did with these OSEM high yellow animals were like, you know, resulting in nothing good. And I'm like realizing that it's because I had animals that were genetic mutts in a way. And I'm not saying that in a bad term. It, it took Eugene and Trooper from 1976 to 1996 to to get these animals to the point where trooper had blue ones and and eugene had yellow ones you know so it's like that's quite an accomplishment but it made me realize that those animals were not phenotypically correct you know they were they were crosses and again i'm not knocking it i love those animals those were got me into green tree pythons when i i saw a, a yellow a pure yellow and green green tree python at eugene's place back in the 90s and i lost my mind because every green tree python up until that point in my life was green yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i eventually ended up buying that animal from eugene in 2003 and i traded him a lot of high-end ball pythons for that animal which was uh mayan gold and it's its brother and uh, another female. And that's what started it for me because I had already been breeding green trees and then I started getting into his stuff and I did very well with them. I made a bunch of them and, you know, got into it. And then that's what got me into more of the, you know, because Biox started coming in and and back then in the, in the early 2000s, um, Cameron was bringing in um, Wamina, Lyra, you know, all high altitude animals that were really cool looking. So, and how much of that stuff did you ever eventually work with, or did you only work with certain? Um, I I I did the Waminas and the Liras for a long time. Okay, and um, I should have kept them because they're very high end now. You can't even find them. So um, uh, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to poke your brain on this one then, uh, Ben, because there's a lot of people out there who've worked with these type of um, higher mountain localities and. They say a lot of them are not as easy to establish. Is was that the same for you? No, they were easy to establish, and they were easy to breed. Um, the problem was they were smaller snakes. They had smaller clutches. Um, the babies weren't as easy to get started. They probably were eating geckos in the wild. I would sometimes use um, leopard gecko babies if I couldn't get them to eat. Um, but yeah, they they once they did start eating, they were they were great. I had no, I had no issues like that. Again, I'm kicking myself and I'm holding on to more of that stuff. Let me pause you, Ben, because I want to go back to something you just mentioned. Okay. Because if it's one, one, but one, one importer that I was very happy to meet within the last few years, because I got to tell you, the importers usually fucking put you through the ringer, man. They'll, they will fucking hang dry you and take your money and never talk to you again. But this one importer, Dan, Dan Moray, you know, Dan Mor Moray, uh, DM exotics. I don't know if you heard of him. Um, oh, yeah, Dan Maleri, yeah. Maleri, Maleri. I always fuck up that last name. Sorry, Dan. Dan Maleri. Um, he's somebody I had such a great experience with working with imports 
that it kind of gave me hope. Like it gave me an idea that like, you know, first and foremost, not everything comes in as good as it should. But Dan was somebody to where if he sold it, he established it. Like he, like yeah. he, it was with him, it's healthy. And now it could go where it needs to go. Um, but there were, there, there's a time and place where some people just rather have so much, some of the most rarest stuff. Like, I mean, come on, Dave, let's talk about Forrest. Forrest had good close relationships with, really bad importers but because of what they were bringing in he didn't give a shit he was like go ahead fucking take advantage of me i don't care i want that snake um were there certain snakes in your collection in that kind of same situation where like you didn't care who it came from it was that important that you got your hands on that snake and we're talking like well, no matter what time of the well, what era this was i'm just curious was that something that you even had to do at some point well, you got to keep in mind, my brother and I were, were importers. We were bringing in stuff wow. from like 1987. Did you, say, did you say that on the first episode? I don't know. <laughs> wow. Okay. Tell me so more. From please. like 87 to like 92, we were bringing in – we were one of the first guys to bring in Indonesian stuff. Um, we were bringing in Africa. We were bringing in South America, specifically Guyana. We were bringing in China for a while. Um, Vietnam, Malaysia. Um, so I was, th that's what made me Vin Russo snake breeder. We were bringing in animals and I was seeing these animals come out of the wild and seeing the, the deplorable condition they were coming in from who knows how they were being kept over there in baskets, you know, and uh, we'd bring them in and, and I would nurse them back to health and I would keep them and breed them. And, and I saw that the true value the true value of herpetoculture is captive bred and born animals, period. Luckily, we're at a point now where we don't have to bring in animals. Luckily, we're at a point now where we have guys like Dan Mullary, who goes over there himself and has a house there. He and his wife, they hand select the best stuff that they can. They keep it, nurture it, bring it into the, the United States, and then sell it You know, on the West Coast. That, that's, that, to me, is more of a niche guy you know I've, kn I've known dan a long time i bought animals from him many 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 years ago so yeah. he's like i was you know he was like i'm going to bring in these animals and i want them to be good so that's so cool point being we're at a point now where we don't have to worry about that but yeah was it a problem yeah there was a lot of junk dealers back then a lot yeah i mean since we're on this talk topic of chondros you know i, I gotta say one of the biggest excitements i see is when i i have somebody i just meet who is very vested in the ball python game and god bless all you ball python people because that's my foundation that's my platform but they they want more out of what they're doing right and so when i get them excited about getting into the chondro game it kind of does something to me but honestly like i don't even know where i was going with that right now this happens once an episode ben i'm so sorry uh i'm not perfect <laughs> all Wait, right remind me what were we just talking about dave can you can you bring me back please I'll be honest. I was so concerned about what I was going to say next. I wasn't listening. Okay, Ben. I, I hate to ask you this, Ben. This happens once every episode. But what were we just talking about right now? I'm so sorry. Quality of animals coming in the country. No. Stop, Dave. I mean, that was it, I thought. <laughs> okay. Dave, take it over, man. I'm so sorry. This happens once an episode, and I, I admit it, okay? So don't Your mind's worry. racing. I'm excited as fuck. Yeah, this is great. Go ahead. How about this? Um, okay, Vin. So, you know, you're talking about doing this in the mid to late 80s. You were importing animals. Now, you know, I remember talking to like Jeff Ronnie. You remember the Jeff Ronnie VHS tapes? You'd send VHS yeah. tapes out to a bunch of customers. They'd watch it, pick out the animals, give them a call and get their animals in. Right, right. Back in the 80s when you were doing this, like, were you communicating with guys like Bob Applegate? Um, Nice. Uh, Bill Brandt, like, were those guys like on your radar, or were, did they not even exist when you were doing what you were doing? No, no, Bob. I knew Bob Applegate back then. Yeah, he was the only guy who was breeding, uh, you know, like mountain kings and milk snakes, and you know, you you heard about him. There was a, a bunch of guys in New York too. There was a guy named Dick Gergen. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I've heard the name. Don't know what he looks like. Don't know him personally. He was like the first guy I ever met who bred um, like Wolmas and stuff like that, you know? Okay. Um, so there was, you know, and there was another a little Lloyd Lemke on the West Coast. He was a big deal. He bred a lot of stuff. Lloyd, um, yeah. Guy named Gary, Gary Sipperly was on the West Coast too Gary back Sipperly, then. Yep. He had a little price list that he would mail to, to me and my brother. Um, 
Hey, Dave. Oh, hey, Dave. Remember this one, buddy? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Bob didn't know I was touching him. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's Bob, Bob was enjoying like one of those complimentary desserts at U.S. Arc Auction. Just, you know, probably had a very long day. And uh, Dave just sat right next to him. And I, I saw his eyes. Like, his eyes were like this big. <laughs> I whipped out I whipped out my phone, dude, and they're like that's this is what I captured and what an iconic moment, man. Um I'll be honest, I, I really do enjoy Bob. Um Bob was nice enough to invite me out to his home in June. Um he said, Come out for a new moon and we'll do a little herping together. If I do one thing this year, it will be going herping with Bob Applegate. Nice. So um well, you know, talking to like the old days. So, Ben, in the late 80s, mid 80s, when you were doing this, were you selling animals by the foot or was there an established price at this point in the market? No, no. Price lists were by the foot. So, a corn snake was, you know, $5 a foot, $10 a foot. Um, even boas were sold by the foot. I remember getting a price list from Florida, from um, the shed in Florida. And it's, <laughs> I remember the boas on there were called Boa Constrictor Rubricorda. <laughs> like red tail, red tail, Rubricorda Boas. $20 a foot, something like that, you know? So um, back in the day, did you ever get an animal in and it was a foot when it should have been two feet and made a whole big stir about it, or was everything pretty legit? No, nobody nobody cared. It was all bullshit. It really was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think even the early days back at Daytona, most of the dealings were done in people's rooms, I heard. Yeah, definitely. The first year I went, um, my brother and I didn't even have a table. We just went and, you know, hung out and, uh, and went, went to the, the vendors, but did all our business in the room. Because back then we knew all the Florida guys, you know, keep in mind, um, a bunch of the Florida guys used to be New York guys, like um, like um, Burgundy Reptile, Mike Ellard. He, was, he lived up in New York. Mark Cantos, um, who's got... Uh, the turtle source. He was, he, he and I, you know, used to go herping up here. Um, so a, a few of my friends, Chris Clark, he's from Florida too. They all moved down to Florida and they're like, Vin, you should come down too. And so my brother and I went down for the national reptile of breeders expo, which was in Orlando back in 1990. And um, so we knew most of the Florida guys down there and we would do business with them. There was a guy, um, Fauci, it was his last name. He, he had a, a, a big wholesale company. We knew Crutchfield. We did business with Crutchfield all the time back then. So it was like a, a good old boys reunion when we went down there. Pe these were people that we talked to on the phone. We got to meet face to face, you know? Nice. Yeah. We don't realize how good we have it now that we can all just connect by a click of a button. Right. Um, you know, I love hearing the old stories about how we did business. Like I said, the um, I met a guy at a show in Cleveland one time that collects VHS tapes from Jeff Ronnie. <laughs> but anytime he could get his hands on an old one, he would buy the damn thing. Right. That's but. funny. I have a we, question. Uh, no, go ahead, Ben. We used to just mail pictures, but you you know you'd have to take oh, yeah. take the picture. I remember hearing about those days? <laughs> you'd go to the. There wasn't one hour photo. <laughs> it would take a couple days. <laughs> get your photos <laughs> and then put them in an envelope and mail them out. But okay, but you think about how the average person, how impatient they are, right? Like think oh, about. Yeah. People are like, fuck it. Like they get the photos and they like, like that was your options back then. People <laughs> understand how easy they have it nowadays. It's and instant. It's crazy to me. Yeah. And what's crazy is like, you know, I, Dave is, we were talking, Dave, Dave, we were talking earlier about vending and how like, you know, I vended my first show and how I'm very terrified to do that ever again, as far as bringing animals, because I wasn't properly prepared i didn't have heat i thought my animals were gonna die i had a really bad time as far as having the animals there but meeting people was great okay um but it just wasn't the best experience for me you know i, ha I had to be ready for that um but you know that also that comes with experience as as we said right ben you know so um again well, good that was a tough show man um those temperatures were low um, even I was not prepared. Go figure. I left all my heat tape at home that weekend. Wasn't ready to walk into those sit in that situation. Had to run up front to triple L buy heat rope to get us through the show. So yeah, that was, that was a rough start, man. It's, it's all uphill from there. I know, <laughs> but, but what's crazy is like, God damn it, man. Like Dave, 
I was just saying about how I don't look forward to even looking at people's tables at shows because I don't, there's nothing I want to buy, but I will easily spend money at your table. And I have, I've had spend money at your table. That, that is the one table where I would look. Cause I mean, if it's one thing I don't have enough of, and I, I'm sure I do, but I don't or the boas. Right. And buddy, Dave, your boa game is just next level, man. Like I really love where you're taking the boas. Um, but it's crazy how what you have at a table, no matter how amazing it is, doesn't guarantee a sale all the time, does it? Um, no. Um, you know, I don't know if Finn's noticed this, um, but I've noticed that BOA sales are different in different states. Um, you know, I have some states I don't even take BOAs to anymore because I know no one's going to want to buy them. No laws, nothing like that impacted. It just simply there's not an established community. Um, and I did a show in Salt Lake City about four months ago, and I got another one coming up in a couple of weeks, and I brought a ton of boas. Um, you know, we have Thomas Cobb there, um, Jeremy Stone, um, Snake Keepers in that state also. I thought there was going to be this established boa community. I didn't sell a boa the entire weekend. I think I brought six displays of them. Wow. So, you know, where – you know, California, we have a lot of boa breeders out there. I expect to do well with them. You know, we buy from each other, I find, when I go out there. You know, it's weird. The boa community is weird. Like I said, it's you don't find boa lovers everywhere. And then you get into these little communities in these little states, and it's just like everybody's buying. You? Me? Yeah, like, have you noticed that? But you, you're, you only do a few shows, though. You're regional. Yeah, you're not too crazy. Yeah, I don't do a lot of shows. I don't like moving the snakes around that much. Um, yeah, but I noticed the states that that allow uh, large pythons, the, the people there aren't into boas. Like I did a show in um, in New Hampshire, and I sold a few boas, but just like you said, to other boa people that were there, you know, at the show, other vendors. But as far as the general public walking in and buying boas from me in New Hampshire, no, but the guys that cross from me were selling Burmese pythons. They were flying out the door. <laughs> yes. I, I think that one thing that the community lacks is a presence like you have with Justin. And honestly, Justin is a rarity. We, we never really had anybody that puts the kind of time in, um, talks about animals and colors in the way he does in his videos weekly. You know, if there was somebody in the boa community that did take the initiative, talked about the animals, talked about the development of a project over five years or a decade, I do think that would create more interest. And I do think there's a lot of other communities that have that guy. This community has never really had that guy. Like, there's not really a all-star person in this community that stands out from everybody else. There's a lot of equals, and there's some people up there, but... In my opinion, there's a lot more equals in the community. Well, wh whoever we did have can never come on a podcast ever again. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> there are a lot of guys on YouTube. Oh, that that like, <laughs> just trying to, you know, you know, do some boa I, things. But no, but no, hold on. Dave is completely right because the biggest trend within the last, I don't know, fucking six years that I've been in this, it's been ball pythons. But everything has been on this goddamn pedestal like I, like ben ben i'm talking to the point where i wish forrest was still alive because forrest was that guy to tell me like how ridiculous it is that i'm really investing in a ball pythons and he would always argue that nobody's making money in ball pythons and literally i want to say the year that he passed away our closest like people within our our circle were coming to me asking me hey mj if, uh like looking around um if, if if I were to get in the ball python game, like how how what would you, what do you recommend? And it's like, oh, funny that you mentioned that. You know what I mean? But I mean, at the end of the day, there's not been a push like that for the boas. But th but that's why. Okay, but there's also the I guess you could say the same thing for the bloods and the short tails, right, Dave? Um, or what about the chondros? Like who's pushing things the way the ball pythons are being pushed? Uh well, you know, chondros and bloods, I wouldn't even oh, compare I those communities. I, I, I think the chondro community is already like this exclusive little thing. And, you know, this is a horrible way to talk about an animal, but um, Forrest used to refer to it as the money sign of your collection. Like that's, that symbol I refer, of... I refer... Dude, he's not wrong. I refer... my. I look at my... 
I, I have a room that's divided, Dave. I have a money room, and then I have a piece in like I don't give a fuck about the money room, which is this is that room. But when I'm on that room, I look at things I need to breed or get rid of. That's it. Yeah. So with the bloods, um, you know, Tracy years ago, and Vin remembers this. It was going to be the next ball python. Um, you know, there was so many new mutations they were bringing in, um, so much potential that everyone said these are going to be the next big thing. I've been hearing that for 20 years, I feel, at this point. Um, now, I'm not saying that Bloods would always have a spot in the community. And generally, in my opinion, the fact that they now have a pie blood will be the moment when they actually become maybe a bigger thing than they are now. But, you know, this whole comparison of what's going to be the next ball python, no one's ever going to have that conversation. Um, There's how only going to be one ball python. Yeah, back when corn snakes and colubrids were kind of the industry, especially corn snakes, were people like boas are going to be the next thing, balls are going to be the next thing, or do they just focus on their corn snakes? Yeah. Well, you know, corn snakes were, were still are pretty big. I mean, oh, yeah. know, they just go to the box stores now. And, you know, I think Petco buys something like 80,000 corn snakes a year, something like that. So, yeah. you know. There'll always be a market for them, but I don't think there'll ever be another ball python. I mean, if you ask me, boas have a close sure. second now that they're smaller races. The only problem that, that I see for the blood python slash short tail python is their size. So they get pretty big, especially the, 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 the blood pythons. You know, I breed short tails. They're a little smaller, a little more manageable, especially like the black Sumatran ones. Um, but the the big the big brown gersame that they could get big, you know, a lot bigger than than a ball python, a lot bigger than a boa. I mean, th their weight is there's a lot of weight on some of those animals. So that that to me may be one of the 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 deterrents in why they didn't become the next ball python because they're not the same size. They're much bigger. But Vin, I gotta I gotta tell you this. The person makes the project. Like, like, like Dave was saying, Justin is doing the most and he's done the most for years. Like, if anything, people are just now trying to do what he's doing, but the guy has been on a level mentality wise on these ball pythons that nobody could even phantom of. Oh, yeah. To where, like, it's just like we just need, like, like maybe there is that person out there. Like, maybe, maybe there is. Maybe it's this guy. I don't know. Like, I. Okay. No, you, you, Dave. Here's the thing. Look behind. Look behind Vin. He has guitars, bro. Like he's busy. He has a life. And I'm not saying you don't have a life, but I think I think you need to push the influence side more, bro. Sorry, Dave. You know my favorite thing about this conversation is you're all like the guy who showed up 45 minutes late for a podcast that he was really excited about should be a guy who spends every week trying to make a video like. Justin does, even if it's only eight to 10 minutes long. Also, again, with limited genes, we can only have so many videos here talking about boa constrictors. Um, it's getting more diverse now, don't get me wrong, but I find with Justin's videos, and again, the fact that he's working with, not personally, but 300 different genes and ball pythons, there can always be another video. There can always be another color phase we didn't think was possible another pairing that did sign that we didn't think it would do in boas. I find that boas is more of an art form because it's generation of generation breeding to improve on what you have. Vin has some of the best looking bloods in the industry for blood boas, the reddest. It didn't happen overnight. He didn't run across one that improved everything. Not at all. It improved over time. And now he has them where they're at right now. So it's hard to get someone excited about something when you sit them down and say, let me tell you about what you're going to do in 10 years. Well, you know what? I basically wrote the books that I wrote for the same reason that Justin does these videos. But the problem with books is a lot of people don't read. They get the books. They look at the pictures. They read a little bit because you wouldn't believe the amount of emails I get with questions about things that are that are in the book and they'll say by the way i read your book you didn't read it if you're asking that question yeah. you know they're all various questions but what i'm getting at is 
you know, I thought about doing the video thing too. I'm like, maybe I'll, I'll do a video, you know, this, what makes this snake great, you know, and I'll, and I'll go over it. But here's the problem. Number one, the time. Number two, I consider myself a snake breeder. I'm not a YouTuber. There you go. There, there you go. There's, there's a passion that comes. Yeah. There's a passion that comes from either I just breed snakes or look at me and I breed snakes. Okay. But at the end of the day, it's either you're doing that because it's about yourself or you're doing that because you want to spread the word and bring more people in. I got to tell you, Vin, as much as it probably would irritate you to have to make a fucking YouTube video and be out there, I guarantee you it would pull so many people just because how much your book, just a book, okay, had an influence. I, I, I And I got to – I mean, Vince, what do you do for uh, – I know you told me this before, but – what is your is are, you're not just a full time reptile breeder, right? Like obviously the stuff behind you, like I remind remind the people out there what else you got going on um, that financially maybe supports you other than snakes. I just breed snakes. That's it. <laughs> Wait, well, what's behind you then? You're, so okay, no, I'm sorry. Hold on, I'm sorry. Greg Maxwell is the guitar repair guy. I'm sorry. I thought I he's was a thinking, luthier. So yeah, okay. am I. I. I build guitars too, but I I play in a band, so I collect basses. Somebody just said in the chats that you were a franchise gar guitar center. So I just wanted to make sure that wasn't that. <laughs> uh, hey, MJ, do you know about Vin Russo and bonsai plants? No, tell me. Dude, why have I been looking? I've been YouTubing bonsai plants lately. That is crazy. If you, just, if you went on YouTube and put in Vin Russo bonsai, there's what? videos of me doing bonsai demonstrations. Oh, he's gonna look right now. <laughs> no, because I don't know why I haven't seen him. Because listen, there's a couple things I've been going down this rabbit hole. Because like, guys, guy, YouTube is life. You, I mean, I don't know, not for you, maybe Vin or fucking goddamn Dave Levison, who barely gets internet. But for me, <laughs> YouTube is like my world. Like, if I watch, I don't watch television. I watch YouTube. So I've had a couple addiction lately uh, of stuff I've been watching. One of them is hoof trimming or you know like people who like trim hooves because yeah, there's ab yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 there's like abscesses and like but like it just it gives the animal so much relief and i love <laughs> see i love seeing that but then, i like those too yeah, it's crazy like but then <laughs> for, for some reason i got i tapped on a bonsai trimming video and and it would there was no music there was nothing it's literally the person it's all yours like you hear snipping and i'm like Wow, this is great. Um, and, and, and I and honestly, this is very new to me. But for you, Vince, like, what what does it do to you? Like, what's what's the purpose of you, like, even putting out bonsai energy out there? <laughs> I'm just curious. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what happened with bonsai. My my, and I'll make it a short story. My my father was stationed in Japan in 1952 during the Korean War. And he went to uh, the Omiya bonsai village and saw bonsai for the first time in his whole life. And when he came back to the United States years later, it, it left an impression on him. Right. And he uh, went, went to the, the Bronx Botanical Gardens and he saw classes in, in the 60s. He saw that a guy was giving classes on bonsai, a guy named Yuji Yoshimura. So he went and took the classes. This was in the late 60s. And he met a few people there that later on became bonsai artists that were well known in, in on the East Coast. And when I was a kid, my brother, my father would take me to one of these guys bonsai um, studios and I became an apprentice there as a young man. Wow. And um, that guy took me under his wing and and I learned bonsai from him and he had learned from a Japanese master. And then he introduced me to a Japanese master who I was an apprentice of also. And then later on in life, I had another um, master that I had as, a, as, a, as an older person. And now I'm at the point now where I, I teach it. Uh, I do bonsai um, demonstrations with the, the Long Island Bonsai Society, um, the Brooklyn Bonsai Society. And, um, and I, I do it for myself. I, I, it's like for me, it's like a Zen thing, you know. But 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 it, it, from what I understand, it's all about balance, right? Or is that like the um, like it, w what's the idea of trimming? Like I'm I'm because there's a certain way that you have to cut certain branches off, and and that's the one thing I'm trying to like pinpoint. Well, yeah, it, it's balance. You don't want to. 
what they mean by balance is not standing on one foot and balancing yourself. The tree is balanced, meaning the energy in which it's sending um, to the branches needs to be balanced. It, it can't be um, all one-sided. The tree needs to be balanced so that sunlight gets to the entire tree so it keeps that shape. You know, when a tree grows in the wild, it, it grows indefinitely and straight up. And and it gets to a point. Yeah, that's me doing it. There he is. Look at this guy right now. <laughs> um, do they? Hey, do they? Hey, do these? Do these bonsai trimmers even know who you are? Like, do they? Do they? Do they even put any respect on your legacy in the snake game, or they? They give two shits. I'm just. They wondering. don't know anything about snakes, but I have a, a lot of respect in the bonsai community too. I love it, man. Well, can we? We could maybe talk more bonsai after this podcast. You cool with that? But yeah. That to me, I, it was, I told I told you before I have koi too, so I've got koi in that, Okay, yeah, koi. I mean, listen, I bought my first house, and now I can really think about putting in a pond. Um, and that's koi fish, man. I mean, another thing, like we're off topic. Dave Levison is. I gotta say, the reason why I even became so intrigued with Dave is his his nature pictures. Like, he, like Dave will be out there in nature, like in the shits living life and, and 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 i call myself a reptile keeper but i feel like a real reptile keeper will put himself out there you know and, and 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 i don't know man i just really love and dave you know this i mean man it's very second to none the way you have certain pictures of you living life out in fucking nature dave i'm not gonna lie it's it's well, it's, it's beautiful well i kind of grew up outside um you know i lived in wisconsin i Woke up, I was like five, six, seven years old. I get a bucket, go down the road, play in the field all day, see what I can get in my bucket to bring home. Um, you know, even at the age of 18, when I found out about like mutations in the reptile industry, I didn't even fully even understand about there even being a reptile industry. Um, then I did. Um, I just didn't pay attention to the magazines, didn't really pay attention to even though there were shows. It all kind of happened overnight for me, to tell you the truth. Um, but really, I just always enjoyed the animals. I mean, yeah, it, there's no more to that. That That's it. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying like, I mean, cause I don't know, like I can count on one hand how many times I've been herping. Right. But the times I've seen shit out in its natural environment, it, it does something to you, obviously. Um, but it's you know, rewarding. It's rewarding. Yeah. It's really rewarding. It's really awesome. But well, you know, you know when I was a young kid, the only way you could see a reptile is to go and find one. Right. Yep. You know, that, that was it. So growing so up in New school. York, my parents sent me to this sleepaway camp every summer. And I would go looking for, I found milk snakes. I found, obviously, painted turtles, bullfrogs, garter snakes, whatever I could. And to me, that was like the coolest thing in the world, you know. And, and Dave and I are, are fishermen. We, we constantly send him pictures to each other. But I've been fishing since I'm a little tiny kid, and now yep. I fish pretty much weekly. Me too, but like I, I'm not the same fishing that Dave does, or maybe not you. Like Dave's in the river; he's fucking. I, I, I go to I go to a pier with a bunch of Filipinos, and uh, <laughs> and they're just fucking. All they want is mackerel. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's fucking crazy. You want to know a story about my fishing days? Check this out. You guys, you guys might appreciate this. So, you know, being in Southern California, like I grew up around a beach called imperial beach imperial beach is the last beach before tijuana before you get that mexican border but where the border lies at there's 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 a mouth like okay so where the border lies at between america and mexico uh, at the beach there's a big mouth and and this mouth has the ocean water that goes into an estuary and the estuary is on the american side right but like it's kind of like roped off like you're not supposed to like like you're supposed to leave that shit alone. But what I found out is if you know what you're doing and if you, yeah, maybe, I'm not going to lie. I did go into the rope side, right? But because I wanted these halibuts, there were halibuts. Halibuts would go into these estuaries and lay their eggs and go back into the ocean. Um, and I, I'll never forget one, one summer, man, we caught like these two, like over four feet halibuts. These halibuts were so fucking big 
and we had like it was just a, it was literally the the time the, the the time of a lifetime for anyone. We had like over thirty mackerel. Like we were nonstop just pulling things in, and that that's what was telling me. I'm like, I don't think we should be fishing here, but whatever. Like, and and, and we put all this shit on a stick, okay? And we were me like fourteen years old. We were walking back. Here comes fucking um. I mean, I don't know what you call it. I guess lifeguards, but there were rangers, and they measured all our animals to make sure, and all these fuckers were big enough. And I can't tell you how these fuckers from the piers, and when I say fuckers, these Filipinos, they saw, <laughs> they saw us coming with all these fish, and they, like, dude, I got paid five bucks for a mackerel. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and it was like, and, and, and then I tried doing that again, and guess what? We got fined. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They, um, I'm not proud of myself. That was 1998, by the way. So it's weird. Um, there was a spot up in Toronto we used to go fishing, and Toronto's got a lot of regulations. They'll have a line across the river that says, don't cross this line, don't fish this line. You'll get to the line, and literally on the other side of it, there will be salmon and trout, and they never cross the line. Like, they just simply know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, fishing, man, too. Like, you know, my grandpa put a fishing pole in my hand when I was two years old. Um and going out fishing is why I was catching snakes as a kid, why I was catching turtles, why I was catching frogs. So really, if anything, me being in the hobby is because I was a fisherman as a kid. Yeah. I saw my first timber rattlesnake fishing. Yeah. You know? I saw my first timber rattlesnake five years ago. <laughs> I mean, I, and like I said, like I've, I have not experienced like fly fishing, like every – Every type of fishing I've done has, has either been deep sea or like, you know, you know, Pacific Ocean shit. Um, but I've always admired, like, you know, like I said, Dave, when I see you show the stuff that you, the trout and stuff that you catch and you're fully geared up and you got those vipers on, buddy. Oh, man, it makes me happy. I'm like, damn, Dave, is he's in his element right now. Yeah, but, no, I But Dave, you and your pops, you and your dad, rest his soul. You guys were he, he was the reason why you're such a big fisherman. Am I right? Oh, no, not at all. He, he didn't fish at all. No, his father was the fisherman. Oh, My dad shit. didn't give a shit about fishing, and he didn't like the reptiles that much. Wow. Um, he <laughs> to well, I wouldn't even say tolerated the reptiles. Um, you know, I bought my first boa constrictor when I was eight years old. Uh, my birthday was in August. Between birthday and Christmas money, I, I could afford a boa constrictor. It was like, what, $129? Yeah. By the time I was 11... It was six feet long. It was nasty. We were feeding it like two rats a week. It was in a 55-gallon tank. It was more his responsibility than mine, and he was terrified of it. Um, but, again, you know, I just – I think like any parent, I just loved it all so much, they never said no. Right. But I don't think any 8-year-old kid should ever buy a boa constrictor. Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like not well, even as a baby. Well, maybe one of the mountain boas, but um, I'm definitely not going to recommend a Colombian, Peruvian, Argentine, anything like that. But maybe something smaller would be appropriate. What yeah. about a viper? <laughs> a captive bred viper boa by Vin Russo? Yes, I do think that'd be the way to go. And Vin, Vin, since we brought vipers up, that's one thing I've seen so many people get their hands on they think they are they're onto something and they just tank like first and foremost they don't want to put in the time and then even if they get if they even get to that point of having babies they can't get them to eat so what what's what what's the secret behind the viper boas man it's an ancient chinese secret <laughs> oh man so realistically ben how many people in the united states are even breeding viper boas you know i don't know i don't know I don't know too many people. I know that I do it. I know Kevin McCurley has done it. I know, um, I, I know um, John from Albinos Jordan. Unlimited did it. Um, but you know, to me, they're pretty easy. Okay. I think if you can keep a conjure python, you can keep a viper boa. That's the way I look at it. Well, I think I, people I, keep them too dry and they feed them too much and. You know they're dealing with wild caught animals most ninety nine percent of the time, and those wild those wild caught animals, the wild caught viper boas, are riddled riddled with parasites, and they're so good at at acting like there's nothing wrong that you won't know it. You know what I mean? You you just won't breed them, right? 
Well, or they'll they'll look fine for a month, six months to a year or two, and then they'll just drop dead. So my most the, the most success I've had was with uh, the captive born and bred animals and raising them up. And the way I did it was I started years ago in the '90s with two wild caught females that um, were doing well for me, and a. Uh, a wild caught male that was a really good breeder and they had those females had babies and I just kept everything they made. And I've been working with just the animals from that line ever since. So, so with the pair, cause you posted a picture in this past five or 10 days, I feel of a pair that you had together pretty drastically different when it came to color. Mm -hmm. What have you noticed in your babies? Like, is it kind of like Amazon tree boas where you just get this wide variety regardless of what your parents look like? Yeah, you get you get everything. You know, you get light ones, dark ones. That they, they all come out different. Um, the only reason I haven't done red to red yet because all of my males have always been the dark ones. I've ne I haven't made any red males yet in the, all the years I've had them. So, and it's weird. The weirdest thing is out of out of all the clutches that I make, they're predominantly females. The clutches. So males are not that easy to find. So what I've been telling people that want to buy females from me is I tell them buy a couple females, raise them up, and then get a wild caught male. And if you if he's a good breeder, then you'll get a whole new lie out of it. You know. Yeah. So you, use um, a wild caught male. So you know, like some colubrids, you find your males are brighter. Uh, more vibrant colors, especially when you start talking about some of the mutation stuff with this, it's just not the case. Do you think it's maybe something like that where females are supposed to look better? I don't know because all the males I've had are pretty dull. I, I have, but then again, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's like, Oh, I got a bright red male, you know? So to me, it's like you, the perfect example is what you brought up. They're like Amazon tree boas that they're, they're completely what is that polygenic? I mean, there's, there's every, there's the full spectrum of colors when you, when you have the, when they have babies. So. Yeah. A uh, local pet store when I was, sorry, then I'm done MJ local pet store when I was 18 Mark Himes, it was called Mark Himes. They had a 1.2 group of Amazons and a corner display. They had had babies every year and there'd be a red one, a yellow one, a garden phase, an orange one. And every year I just bought a different color. Right. Yeah. Were you gonna say something, MJ? I mean, I, I, I have a topic that's just—it's like I feel like I have eczema, and I don't. I'm just saying it's itching me. I feel like I just—we just need to talk about it because there's a lot of pushback going to anybody right now, Vince, who keeps—I mean, I don't want to just say ball pythons in racks, but almost anything in racks. And I don't know if you know, Vin. I know you're a private guy. You do your thing. I don't know how much of this stuff you've heard so far but there's research is out there right now um stating that ball pythons kept in racks generationally like after generation and generation of ball pythons keeping in racks it's keep it's it's shrinking their brain like their brain is continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller um can, can, can i can just I, say I, one thing I finished, did you read that thing because there was can, actually can no finish? scientific proof of anything and anything they did it was i think it was speculation it was an opinion piece in my opinion i got it right here buddy i got it right here then did you see this pop up it was a couple of weeks ago it was a hot topic and then it kind of fell off can you can you can you read that then or no no i can't read it okay hold on so it says brains of royals in racks when a royal is taken and then raised in a rack with a lack of stimulation in complete darkness with little to no opportunities, the following could occur. Could no, or will? Could, could. Does yeah. it say, does opinion it piece. So opinion piece. Okay. Is that, is that what you're getting at here, Dave? Well, it's a lot of speculation. I don't think there was any true science. And what's their argument? An animal that lives in a hole and is nocturnal in the wild is not doing well in a dark situation. And, I'm not defending racks by any means. I love stuff like this. And I think all of us, if we knew there was a better way, we would do it. But Vin knows if a customer calls you and says a ball python's not eating, you say, how big's your cage? And do you have a light on top? And if they say their heat source is a heat bulb or it's a 55-gallon tank, 
the animal does not do well in those conditions most of the time. So I don't really know how I feel about this, man. This, this feels like some kind of weird new agey kind of argument. You know, I, I would take it, you know, as gospel of a guy like Eugene Bissett, who's had ball pythons in captivity for 38 years, had an observation over four or five generations. But for somebody to say they might or they could, I don't, I don't go for that. And, and like you said, Dave, the perfect example is this ball python. They live in a termite mound in the ground or in a hole in the ground. They, they, they will, they barely leave that hole, especially during the dry season. And when they do, they leave to eat and they go back in. They may interact with other ball pythons through breeding. I don't see any difference between that and what happens in a, in a rack. So. Okay. And also, let's think of this, right, guys? I mean, we all know clearly there's certain reptiles that cannot do well in a rack. And that's where we kind of put our brains to, to sense here. Like, okay, like let's put a lace monitor in a rack or, or yeah, something. You're not right? going to put your green tree pythons in a right, in right. A or, 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 even, rack. Or, or even a reticulated python. How about that? Right. Okay. Like, like that thing needs way more than a rack. Okay, because it's a bold animal. Like, if we think about bold, confident animals, you're right. Don't put them in a rack. A ball python is the last thing of confidence. It's a ball. It 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 it, it wants nothing to do with nobody. It's scared of its shadow. It, dude, if they could go its whole life in the darkness, I think it's gonna be fine. That's how I and, and I'm only going off the way, like Vince when and Dave when somebody comes over to my house. And they've never seen snakes. You want to know the first snake I want to go to? Because I guarantee this snake is going to be fully flawless and fully shed. And, and it's something I want to take out. My ball python. My ball python that's been in a dark little, like, little cupboard, right? It's And, and, and it's coming out eating. Thri like, I, I don't know. It's really hard for me to wrap my brain around this whole, like, oh, my God. We're making, generationally, we're making the ball python more dumber and dumber. Well, if that's the case, how come it keeps eating and breeding? Obviously, it's keeping some sort of smartness. I, what are we? What are we missing here? Uh, well, I mean, just my one thing is, you know, some people think a bull python should have fifty-two meals a year because there's fifty-two weeks in a year and it's on a schedule where I feed it every Tuesday. That's not how it works. Like an animal misses a meal a couple weeks and people are running to the vet. Now, I do understand the compassion inside of making sure your animal is healthy, but sometimes our logic behind this is not really logical. And, you know, I always say in the hobby, if I tell MJ something and MJ tells it to Vin and Vin says it's something to somebody else, it's a fucking fact now in the industry. Just like that because it got repeated. I could have lied to you and you could have told 10 people the wrong way of doing something. Right. Yeah. So, well, you know. Yeah. Here, here is the perfect example in in Europe. I think specifically Germany. If you keep um, pythons and boas, for like if you have a four foot python, it needs to be in like a six foot by four foot by two foot cage. They have they have a mathematical equation. I don't know exactly what it is, but you need a pretty big cage for your for your python. And um, a friend of mine who, who who lives over there breeds ball pythons was telling me that. Vin, you and I both know that a ball python, if you put it in a giant six foot cage by four foot by two foot, it's going to get lost. It's not going to eat. It's going to feel like it's out in the open in a, in a fishbowl and it's just going to succumb and it's going to die. So what he does is he puts a 28 quart Rubbermaid size tub <laughs> in the six foot by four foot by two foot cage with a hole in it and puts the ball python in there. And that's where they live. They never come out. He said, Vin, they don't come out. They stay in there. So it's like, do they know what they want? The python does know what they want. They want to be confined. They want to be secure. They want to be hiding. They don't want to be out in the open. Yeah. Tracy was the same way. Um, you probably remember the old videos of Tracy, um, the vision cages with a rubber made inside hide box that the animals were going inside. Right. Um, you know, same deal, just a large enclosure, but the animal doesn't utilize the enclosure. It utilizes that small, safe space that they're used to. Right, right. Um, here's the thing. I think sometimes, you know, people on the outside looking in the hobby, you know, here's a good example. Um, you know, Freedom Reader and ARS have their new tub that's as long as a CV70, 
but it says, why does their 50 40 series or whatever it is? They're not making these tubs because we can fit more snakes in a smaller area. They're doing it because these animals, when they have that comfort of the walls touching the side of the animal, it's the same as them adding a hide box feature in those tubs. Right. They're doing that because we know that it benefits the animal. So it's not a, we're just trying to jam them out. We want to make as much as possible. We want to fit them in a small space. It's years and years of working with the species. We realize they generally do better in these small areas. It's just up to the breeder to maintain that small space that can get dirtier faster. Right. Right. And it's the same with me with my you know, dwarf boas. They could easily live in a CB70 tray, but they breed and eat and do better in a larger. I use the vision boa tubs and they do better in those because they can sit on the heat and then they can get away from the heat. And that's what they do in a jungle, you know. Yep. So it's like um, you need to you need to duplicate what they what they do in the wild. Yeah. Jeff Ronnie with his cages, he was building the shelves on it yeah, and for years and years. Yeah. Yeah. We saw breeding pictures of two boas on a shelf, their tails dangling down, curled up together during breeding season. So, yeah. you know, there are certain things that you can do to benefit, but sometimes I think just because a person thinks they wouldn't want to live in there, an animal wouldn't want to live in there. Right. That's what right. I'm saying. Like, people... like, 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 like you think everybody wants something with a window or some sort of fucking like enrichment. And I understand some things could use enrichment. Like I love that I have patho plants for all my chondros and stuff like that i mean but 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 is that going to keep them from shedding eating and breeding no and not at all like it's it's because if you're doing everything right by that animal and what i mean by that temperature hydration dieting if all that is where it needs to be you don't need no fucking enrichment like it's like like it's 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 be, it, it, it's gonna make you feel good i mean I, I i don't know ben i gotta tell you right now my biggest argument with this whole shrinking the brain thing of the ball pythons is that people are asking me like well are you are you just saying your ball python is happy just so you're happy and i haven't been in the game long as you guys so kind of yeah i'm not gonna lie like i because i don't see anything wrong with my ball pythons like like i said it's my go-to animal when showing off anything i think that is immaculate and i love everything that's behind me but I don't want nobody touching this first and foremost, but if I want somebody to hold an animal that I've produced and it's like something that they're going to go like this, it's my ball Python. So, well, you know, l l let me, let me give you something. Yes, sir. You know, there's, there's two, there's two opposite ends of the spectrum here in our industry. You have animal rights activists who are like, you shouldn't have anything captivity in captivity, not even a dog. Then there's people such as ourselves who are like, well, Animals are companion pets. The animals we're breeding are multiple generations in captivity. They don't know what the wild is. Just like a dog doesn't know what it means to run in a pack of wolves and hunt down a deer. You feed it a bowl of food every day and it's fine. You know, is it happy? Yeah, it's happy. Would it be happy running in the forest chasing a deer with a, with a pack of wolves? Yeah, it might be happy doing that too. But it's been domesticated so long that it doesn't know what that is. I mean, and we're in, we're, we're in a world this, now. What about what about a dog, Vin? Like, think about a dog. Like, like how much we d domesticated a fucking dog. Right. Well, snakes have gotten that far too, in a way. We've domesticated snakes. I mean, take a look at some of the ball python morphs we have. There's no way they look anything like they would look in the wild. Yeah, and they live. In, they're in captivity. They're, they're multiple generations of captivity. Same with boas. I mean, if you took a. a a sun glow, you know, a, a sun, a sun dragon boa, a sun glow albino blood boa and put it in, in the wild. You think it's going to live? It's not going to live. It's going to stick out like a shit in a punch bowl. It's going to get eaten. It won't even be able to hunt because it can't see that well. It's albino. Well, and, you know, there are rare occasions. Um, you know, Pete Call imported that leucistic adult ball python years ago. I think there were pines found in the wild. Now, those are animals yeah. that should have been killed. Um, even I think there was oh, go ahead. they hide in the underground yep. the first albino ball that Bob Clark had came out of the wild as an adult five right. five adult pied ball pythons came out of the wild five yeah. not all at the same time but over a period of time the um, first 
the ivory ball python came out of the wild. The first leucistics came out of the wild. That's crazy because there's people who out there who say that like no white snake even could survive in the wild like that. And yet in India, there was a leucistic Indian python that's in the on in the back of um, one of the books, either Giant Snakes by Raymond I got the book. I'll send you the picture later. It's like a 1950s or 1960s yeah. edition of a book. It's one of the first couple pages. Yeah, it's yeah. It's a it's a leucistic Indian python. So it's yeah. like they came out of the wild. They 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 could make it. They could, they well, could not, you know. Uh, how about this theory, MJ? What if it's like humans? For years and years, we've been breeding ball pythons to look prettier, and because of that, they're just stupider now. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Oh, okay, okay, but if if you want to talk about how we domesticated a dog just to the same level as a ball python, are there issues with dogs for the most part? I mean, obviously, there's dogs that need training. That's I think that's important. I mean, pugs have breathing problems. I mean, are we talking about different breeds? Or are we talking not, about not, just not, domesticating not, in general? We're not talking about spider ball pythons here, buddy. We're talking about... Hey, 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 hey. They do just fine. Hey. <laughs> Whatever, dude. Whatever. Where am I going? Where am I going? Where am I they going? They ain't all like that, buddy. Yeah, they but, are. Yeah, yeah, they are. I had 17 oh. out of 17. I, no, they are all like that. Hey, Vin, how much spider stuff you have in your collection? Exactly. So stop, okay? Stop. <laughs> Nobody wants no corkscrew for a fucking project, okay? Um, sorry, go ahead. MJ, do you know about um, line breeding foxes in, I think it's Russia, where they domesticated um, foxes. They found ones that were just nicer, and then they bred it to other ones and then held back the nicer ones till eventually they had lap dogs. And they had color morphs, too, from that. Yeah. Um, you know, Junior made a cool comment. This is completely off topic, but you'd appreciate this. Um, Junior from JMG was talking about how young the hobby really is when you compare it to other hobbies like Koi, where they literally took a brown carp in over 100 years, created all these unbelievable looking animals. Right. So what we're doing is infinite. As for the, all that brain stuff. I don't know, man. Are there x-rays? Is there like... There's no scientific proof. Well, that's the thing. I think here, here at the end of the day, this is going to be addressed. I have a podcast lined up where the gentleman who's passionately behind this theory is going to come on the show, you know? And uh, at the end of the day, Vince, you know, I, I, there's not too many people I bring on the show who has as many years under their belt as you. So that's why I had to bring it up. I had to ask you what you thought. I just think, obviously, just like anything else, some things could not be in certain conditions as the other. Um, but I don't know. I, I mean, how I many at some point throughout the years of ball pythons being kept in captivity, if one of us at one point could have saw a difference we could have made with getting them out of a rack, somebody would have done it by now. I feel like I feel like there there would have. I mean, we. I mean, dude, a lot of us love animals. Like I know there's a breeder side, but. There are those people who want the best by the animal, and I look at myself as one of those. I'm just speaking for myself. So I don't know. I don't know. I just – my ball pythons are happy as shit. And, that yeah, I tell myself that, I guess. I don't know. You tell yourself that? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this? And this is genuine. Um, when you do have that conversation with them, I would be really curious on how that idea started. Like – did he dissect a ball python out of the wild compared to one that was four generations later kept and bred and noticed the brain size, the brain was smaller? Like, I don't understand how he even decided to go this route. I don't either. But uh, I think they're just humanizing snakes because those are things that were found in human beings. Human beings that were left alone or depressed or left in you know solitary confinement. You know, those are things that happen to humans, not to animals. An animal, a ball python can be stuck in a hole during a dry season for a year and not move, and it'll be fine. The rains come, it'll go out, drink, and look for a mouse, and it'll be fine. Sometimes that rainy season might not come for more than a year. You know, ball pythons have been known to, to, to go on a hunger strike for more than a year, you know? And, and, and here's the thing. I don't, I don't, this is tough for me to say because I don't have any, like I might've had maybe a couple friends 
who had a really like unfortunate like handicap situation with their sibling where, where like like they couldn't handle like their to take care of themselves right which is really fucked up to see but that's the reality of life but can they figure out how to how to have sex like 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 think about somebody who is continuously fed diaper changed all that stuff like if you just put them with another female can they figure that out i don't i i correct me if i'm wrong i just don't i don't think so i because the way i've seen like uh, like i mind you i had a buddy named louise from elementary school his brother was like 25 years old and i would go over to his house and i would see his mom care for him the way i would see it and i, I remember like being shocked by it but it was kind of a shocking thing that is a bit of a reality of like 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 you could this this could be a reality to you too but I, i'll never forget that but all i could think about is like can that guy have a family someday can he meet a woman and have and have have intercourse and have a kid so what i'm saying is if this was so true wouldn't there be a, a time and place where these ball pythons couldn't breed no more am i right i mean is that well is that you know you, you go back to, to darwin survival of the fittest right and i'm not talking about humans now i'm talking about animals animals period yeah and, and in animals it's survival of the fittest the the weaker animals will not survive you know, humans, the weaker animal, the weaker humans can survive because they're being taken care of by their families. Yeah. But in the, in the wild, an inferior, um, genetically inferior animal does not procreate. It's that pretty that much that simple. So you really can't compare them to humans. I guess you're right. No. Yeah, that, that's that's I know. Well, here's the thing: um, mental institutions. There's quite a few of them in Buffalo, New York, where I grew up. And the reality is, you know, with what you're saying, not that I even think we should be talking about this right now. Right. As long as one of the two people know how to do it, it's going to happen. Um, so it's not a matter of both; it's one or the other, and that's the way it worked in these mental institutions for years. But um, yeah, it's weird, buddy. You've well, been thinking I, about this a lot lately. No, not at all. It, but 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 there, there are certain things in my life that make me never forget about this, and I'll never forget. I will never forget having that friend, whose literally parents' life wrapped around taking care of this one sibling that they had, and, and he was a lot, he was a lot older, and and I was very close to this friend, and I was at his house a lot, and I do I'm, I'm observant. I've been observant my whole entire life, and I cannot help but to be like you know sympathetic and be like, holy shit! I would ask, how old is your brother? what and i'm like 12 just thinking like wow like you know what i mean and god but and that's it's like after i saw that it kept i kept seeing it like obviously there's a lot of this shit in the reality of life i just but i, I just feel like the way this guy is putting it out there it's like the way we're headed their brains are going to get so tiny tiny if what what do you mean like and, and, and are you taking measurements to show this like I don't know. It. I feel like it's an aggressive push against people who just want to breed things that they okay. think they're doing by right. I don't know. Well, how about this then? So with this logic of this study, so would that mean if you took an animal that was five generations captive bred and bred it back to a wild caught animal, all of a sudden you go back to a reset and the brain's back to normal? No. No. No? A little bigger? A little smaller? <laughs> Depends. Depends on the dad. I'm just kidding. All right. um, How about this? Okay, Ben, random question for you, because I've asked a couple of people this one lately, and I think Boa is, is the reason I've been thinking about this. Um, oh, and like with uh, retics, with like dwarf retics, we have people that are like, this is 50% dwarf, 75% slayer, so on and so forth. Do you think the day will come in ball pythons where people will not be satisfied with the size of the animal and will focus more on breeding animals from the Volta region to create a larger animal for the future yeah well you know here's like, the problem with that the difference the size comparison between those two races of ball python is not that extreme and look at the size comparison between like a coyote island retic which in the wild is maybe seven feet long compared to a mainland sulawesi retic where the largest one ever recorded was 33 feet long that's like almost four times, you know, yeah. and I'll bet you the weight wise, it's probably 10 or more times, maybe even more shit. A 33 foot retic has got to be 250, 300 pounds, you know, a seven yeah. foot 
Kaiwadi Ratik is maybe five pounds, you know? So, yeah. I, I, you know, and if you take a, a look at the two different ball python races, you know, one is six feet and what, 10, 15 pounds, and the other one is four or five feet and maybe five pounds, four pounds. So, so too close. Well, yes. you know, we talked about how science changes things. We're always looking to chase the next big thing. I guess my thought process was when we're trying to reinvent it yet again, would that be a direction maybe some people want to go in? You know, and if you look at boas, people do the same thing with boas. They breed a dwarf boa to a, no, a normal Colombian, and they think it's head for dwarf or something, or it's going to stay small. Once you breed out cross it to something else, all bets are off. That snake could be is just as big as a Colombian one day, you know? And it's yeah. the same with those dwarf or ticks. I mean, I don't know why they're mixing them into these mainland or ticks. They should just keep them all, you know, dwarf or tick because – Amen. It's still going to get big, you know. Uh, so, well, yeah. Go, go no, Dave. no. I was just going to say, I think it's um, it's because it's more motivated in the community to where it's we want these snakes. I want this golden child. I want this cow, but I want it to be seven feet. Right. So for that reason, that's why that community goes that direction. Right, but you know, um, it, it still doesn't mean they're going to stay that small. No, it, that's a Garrett. That our um, that's a hurdle question. Hurdle, hurdle. I always call him hurdle. <laughs> hurdle. Wait, well, why, why is that a hurdle question? I'm curious. Well, he does all the door free tick stuff. I feel like he's probably done. He's very okay. I love Garrett, but he has too much suspect going on with his, like what he considers dwarf and whatnot. And, and, and what I mean, and, and and I only say this because God bless Garrett, but he's a marketing guru, like. He is a marketing fucking king. He is the Canova of the Super Dwarf game. So you got to understand, like, kind of what he says. And this is nothing against Gary. I love him. But it's kind of, like, always going to favor what he has going on. You know that, right? I, 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 I'll I, be honest. I don't know. <laughs> this is, this, this it, is why, I'm just yeah. telling you. I'm telling you facts right now. There's, there's a lot of pushback with what Garrett's going on only because – I don't want to say because of the success, even though he's doing really well, bringing a lot of people into the market, but there are people out there who don't give two shits about who knows them, but they have been passionately working with a lot of these SoCal real super dwarfs and not super dwarfs. So there's just too much watered down type stuff being thrown with Garrett's name, which I don't think he's a good example to be talked about right now. Okay. Well, what if um, Vin Russo's comment about how maybe it doesn't mean shit when you bring it to mainland because it changes everything and you really can't say by science it's only going to get this big? You really, you know, yeah. you really can't. I mean, if you breed a, a Kiowati dwarf to a, a mainland Sulawesi, to me, all, all bets are off. I mean, that snake could end up being a big, a pretty big snake. But what's crazy too, guys, is think about this. Like we're talking about the specific sizes of these snakes that come from certain demographics of this country. But then there's also the scenario where, like, think about it. Us humans have midgets. Or oh, damn it! I'm sorry I said that. I did not mean that. I meant little person. I am so sorry. My wife's gonna fucking kick my ass. Damn it! This is Ben Russo's fault. He no, told me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did not mean to disrespect the LP community. I meant little person. But I'm just saying, us humans have LPs that are just, we're humans, but we're smaller. So I think that's almost the same case with even certain mainlands because the biggest problem right now, Vin and Dave, in the Super Dwarf community are people saying that there's Super Dwarf shit going on within their projects, and they're really not. They're really not. But there are certain size where they could get away with saying it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, oh, I'm sorry, Vince. It's probably better off I don't talk about midgets. You go ahead well, and say even, whatever you even, guys even, say. Even, don't say that Dave, word, Dave. Come on, Dave. Going back to humans, LPs, bro. LPs. No, we're going back to humans. Humans. Even we're going to take a, a small demographic. Like even in my family, my mother's barely five feet tall. Ooh. My father was six foot three. Me and my brother are both six foot three. You know, so it's not like. My parents had kids thinking, oh, they're going to be somewhere between five foot and six foot. It didn't happen. We're still six foot three, you know? So it's the same thing with, it's very similar with animals. 
the, the difference is you've got animals that evolved down to smaller sizes. You know, perfect example, the, the dwarf boas. If you talk to um, Dr. Warren Booth and some of these other guys that do, who have been doing the studies, They've they've genetically isolated the gene for these for the dwarfism in boas. They're small. They've evolved to the point where they now have the gene that keeps them small. So the coyote retics and those dwarf retics have the gene to keep them small. Once you breed breed them into a mainland animal, the gene is gone. It's been turned off. The larger, more robust size is more dominant over the recessive gene that keeps something small. Yeah. So it was a forced adaptation. And as soon as you put, like you said, that other blood back in, like you said, it's all that yeah. It's like mixing lemonade and Kool-Aid. You'll never have lemonade or Kool-Aid ever again. Yeah. So really quick, MJ, um, before it's over, do you have any more special needs or any kind of people you want to bring up in conversation? You want to talk about gingers? Do you want to talk about some gingers for a little bit, buddy? No, I want nothing to do with gingers. All due respect, they all have knives, and I'm good. Um, I just want to kind of still talk about the whole prediction for Vin on how he thinks next week's going to go. Like, Vin, obviously, you've been a lot, you've been through a lot of this and that, you know, as far as – I mean, from what I could understand, anyone who's been doing shows like Tinley, you're going to have your big shows. You're going to have your dud shows. What do you think next weekend is going to be like? I'm curious. Well, you know what I've noticed? Um, there's multiple compensating factors at play here. You know, we have what people want to call inflation. They, we have what people want to call recession. But there's one big difference in this recession and this inflation-induced economy, and that is that this was, was done by forces that were not involved with the previous recessions that we've had in history. So, for example, we didn't have pandemics that, that led into things where an overabundance of money was spent and inflation was pushed or, or, you know, forced into control. So we're seeing that the job market, and I'm being economical now because I follow, you know, Wall Street a little bit because I was a mortgage banker for many years. But, you know, we're seeing um, unemployment numbers pretty low. Um, we're seeing jobs markets pretty high. I mean, there's a, there's a requirement for jobs. So people are working. People could work. People could make money. People could spend their money. Whether they want to is a whole nother thing. But I'm noticing that in our industry, um, I'll never use the words recession proof because there's no such thing. But there's, there's a few things that people buy even during a, a recession. That is alcohol, cigarettes, and reptiles. What about so what about weed? <laughs> <laughs> that counts as cigarettes. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, you know what's really funny about this? Bill Brandt once told me this hobby is recession-proof. It is. Bill Brandt knows a lot. Bill Brandt does yeah. know a lot. He's a smart guy. So oh. I don't want to say it's recession-proof because I'm kind of – we you never know. It could change. I mean, anything could happen, right? That's a scary thing, and that's why – I don't know. I feel like not only is diversity important, but like Vin said, anything could change. Anything could change to where it doesn't matter what you keep. It's all fucking not good. And um, oh. support U.S. art. Sorry. So the problem is, too, and you know, I, I know here's the thing. I feel like we've had this conversation every podcast we've ever done together. It's, it's a hot topic. We all want to talk about it. Okay, how about this? Cars during the um, pandemic. Price of used cars went through the roof. Because you couldn't find them. They weren't available. It all came down to supply and demand. Same thing in this industry. New people came in. They wanted a Woma Python. You couldn't find a Woma Python. You couldn't find a Dumoulin's bow because it wasn't something that was always readily available. Right. But there all of a sudden was a larger buyer's pool. So the price went up because of the demand. So, of course, the demand is going to change a little bit. And we always have these highs and lows in the hobby. 
Sometimes it's species related. Sometimes it's just, you know, ball pythons, it's mutation related. But, and also trending, man. A lot of it has to do with fucking trending in this industry. Yeah. Things that should be worth a lot of money aren't because they're not trending at the moment. Right. What oh, yeah. Vin has for sale right now might have been less money 10 years ago if you bought it from Vin. With certain species, certain things that weren't as desirable. True. I mean, you know, I've brought prices, some prices after the pandemic from things that I produced went up because the demand was, was there. Um, some things went down because the demand wasn't there because, you know, the, the ball Python market is the perfect example. So many people got jumped on that bandwagon during the pandemic because they saw there was money involved. So you got a lot of extra, well, extra, you got a lot of people involved in the business far more than there were prior to 2019. So now you're at a point where all these people have all these animals and they don't know what to do with them. So they're going to cut each other's throats and, you know, prices are going to change. That, that's on one part of the demographic, meaning the bull python part. The boa part, they're a little harder to breed. So if somebody got into boas to make money during the pandemic, they're still not old enough to breed yet. You know, think about people that got into ball pythons in 2019 and 2020. They bred them this year, some people, you know. So it's like the time part of things works into the equation, too. You know, you need a little more patience with boas. You need a little more time. Um, you need a lot more discipline. Ben. Don't sugarcoat it, buddy. We need patience. We need patience. Period. That's the oh. problem. Patience <laughs> is patience is the fucking number one issue with everyone right now. Is patience. look behind you. You need patience for all of that. I, what is this? This is my pets. What do you mean? But that's patience because those know. animals need a lot of discipline and patience. Those these animals, Vince, need me. These animals need me. These assholes on animals on the other side. They need morph market. They need fucking. They need. They need the rat race. It's sad, man, but I have rat race snakes on the other side of this fucking wall, and I if I don't promote them the way they need to be promoted, they're not going to sell, buddy. They're not. These right here, I could post saying not for sale, and I'll still sell them. That's what these can do. And and right. and Ben, this is why I love. Like I I like. Here's no disrespect to anyone out there who wants to be known on their resume as a ball python breeder but no that's not me buddy like i i i respect that the ball pythons got me where i need to be at but vince the fact that you work with something that has not been goddamn on a pedestal the way the ball pythons have been you should be really happy to be a part of this game man I, and, and not 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 that not not saying that you're not but dude being low-key is kind of fun when you keep reptiles because isn't that the goal when you keep reptiles? Let's think about that. When you want to keep reptiles, you kind of do it because you know people don't really want to fuck with it. Well, that the, the main reason why I was very low key for so long is because I got robbed so many times. People would just rob shit from me. So. Oh, by the way, I, I <laughs> this I asked Vince because the, the Vince, I don't want to speak for you, but the first the first episode we had was great, right? Like I thought it was a really good episode, right? Yeah. But I asked you if I could go to your place and do the next round at your place, and you you politely declined. You right. said nobody comes to my place. No. Uh, I'll be honest, MJ. I wouldn't even ask. I wouldn't even want to hear but, the no. But hey, I'm okay hey, with that hey, relationship. I would never change a thing. Dave, I have a job to do, buddy. My job is to do things that nobody else can do, and nobody else will do. And Vince. Can we honestly say, like, this is round two, but maybe by round four or five, maybe I could, maybe you could trust me enough to, no, never, okay. It's not, it's nothing to do with trust. There's nothing to do with trust. I trust you, but by being on your show, thousands of people have <laughs> seen. No, okay, but hold on. What, okay, hold on. What I'm saying is, no one right needs now, to see my no, 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 time out. Hold on. I don't, let, let me finish, please, there Vince. <laughs> not, to, not to tell you what to do, but please, Vince, let me finish. I gotta <laughs> say, I, I gotta say, what would be the difference if we were to do this right where you're at? And just just all the people saw were the guitars, and I didn't I and I, I didn't feel nothing else. And 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 meaning I got to saw what you have. Fuck everyone else. I get to see it. Is that a possibility? <laughs> okay. <laughs>
The only way you're going to see Vince place is if you break in, buddy. Okay. What? Okay. What friends out there can go see your place? I can literally count the one hand how many people have been there. So, who's one? Is there anybody I know? Maybe. No. Wow. <laughs> you wouldn't let Gary Shavino at your place? No. Wow. Dude, and I love Gary. Gary, I know. One of my great friends, but I, I don't would, have people over to my place. I would pay thousands of dollars for Gary to come to bite my place. This is crazy. This is nuts. Ben, you know what? I'm going to tell you something, MJ. Right you right haven't up. you haven't woken up one morning and walked into your reptile room and seen it empty. No, because I have pit bulls, buddy. Nobody. Can oh, I, I have I have three German shepherds. Where the, where, the, where were they? <laughs> Well, they're not living in the warehouse all the time. So okay, well, the warehouse is how far from your house? Pretty far. See, Vince, and and, and I will never do that to myself. I I could I roll out of bed balls naked and go to my room and be like, "What happened? Did I hear a movement?" No, I'll go back to bed because of this. So maybe. Well, that that's my that's my plan. I'm going back to that. <laughs> okay. Because so, I'm done. I, at the end of the day, Vince, can I'm we getting too old? I, I've been told no too many times tonight, but I have one more request. <laughs> I have one more request, and you could deny this, but hopefully dropping this name, it might help me. And I don't mean to throw you under the bus, Dave, but Dave Levison told me you guys are going to dinner next Friday. Can me and Mark Bailey crash that dinner with you guys? Can we go to dinner with you guys? Is that is that possible? I don't know. It's up to Dave. Well, uh, we'll talk about it. Here's the thing. Tell me We're no. Trying to make it into, there's like two of us, man. You got, like, it's a big dinner, buddy. This isn't like one of those moments. There's like three of us that go. So two. I think that's it. Mark Bailey. Did I, did I stutter? Mark Bailey. I like Mark Bailey. So but, forget, forget about me. Just say, just think of Mark Bailey and I'm going to be along with him. That's my, that, that's my invite. You know what? I maybe I can't tell people that I go to dinner with Vin anymore if everyone's just gonna ask to come with. Top secret. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I'm not gonna go anymore. Maybe it's just not my style at the moment. Well, way, way to make me look like a piece of shit, Dave. I appreciate it. So, <laughs> hey, listen, I gotta well, say, I gotta say, do you, okay, Dave? Do you have a wrap up question for 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 Vince? Because this has been three hours now. We're um, well, I I I don't, but. Thanks. I do have a wrap-up comment that we talked about. Um, oh. The donation for the U.S. Ark auction coming up this week at Tinley. We have oh, custom yeah. cornhole boards you're going to show off. Do you have the imagery? Um, Let the world know that they need to maybe consider bidding on this fucking majestic-ass fucking set of cornhole boards if you like redneckery. <laughs> redneckery. That's hey, a good but, one. Dave, but Dave, while I'm pulling this up, for any, because like I said, this is the coolest reptile podcast in the world, especially for anyone who's just coming into the hobby. So why would why would this be important for them to go do? Like, what 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 is it about supporting U.S. Arc? I want to hear from Dave Levison. Well, I mean, that's it. You said it, man. Supporting U.S. Arc. Um, you know, whether you've been in the hobby for five years or twenty years, you well, not twenty years because U.S. Arc's not twenty years old yet, but they're close. They're important. We need them. P. Jack, we need them. Like, it's all part of it. Um, any day we could lose anything, and we don't want to lose anything. So here's the thing. I love donating animals. I love donating things like this. I feel like things like this just do better in the auction. It's more fun for people. It's animals, sad. man, I feel like when you donate an animal to the auction, someone wants to buy it with the idea of flipping it half the time. I mean, Items I, like I, this I, is what I, makes I, the auction I, fun. I don't like exactly. I don't like animal buys. I mean, nothing against it. If you have, if you have something to donate, God bless, you, donate it. But these are the memorable things. Like these are the things that you can, like, you can live with. <laughs> We're only making one set of these. This is it. Whoever gets it gets it. I mean, I bought a set of bags for myself, but that's only because I'm fucking amazing at this game. <laughs> yeah, but the, the gifts like this are the higher expensive gifts. I got to tell you, these are ones that go for a lot. Can only hope. I got a couple things in there. Oh, don't forget about the Blake Bear and the Bot Fly and all that stuff, too. That's coming up in a week, also, man. We got all kinds of good things coming in the auction. Are you doing that in the auction as well? I thought that happened in Arlington. I'm confused. You know what? The Arlington vibe was wrong. 
um, things weren't going for as much as they were going to go for. And where I thought that maybe Blake had a bigger following at that show, generally we talked about it. Tinley was the right place for it. I think so. so you can't, you the can't, moment hasn't happened yet. The moment's coming up next week for that too. Well, the moment comes for a lot of things, man. And, 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 and the moment is the round two is a wrap for Vin Russo. But Vin, if you're okay, I, I would love to bring you back on for round three and around four and around. As long as you could put up with me and Dave, I would love to have you back on this show again. Um, but for anyone out there, Vince, sure. Anyone out there who wants to be really on top of what you have available and, and, and God bless people who can't make it to the shows, but, but people who are just listening to this remotely, how can they find out what Vince has available? What's the best way to find out what you have that they can get on their hand, their hands on. I'm curious. Best way would be um, my Facebook page, um, which is Cutting Edge Herp. Um, you can just go to Facebook and search Cutting Edge Herp. Um, Instagram, Cutting Edge Herp. I'm also on Morph Market now, which I just started a couple weeks ago. So, um, and usually if I put some Morph Market stuff, I'll uh, put on my Instagram and my Facebook. It'll say with a picture, it'll say, "Look what I've got on Morph Market this week." Um, reason being because I wasn't able to sell anything on my Facebook and my Instagram anymore because those paid posts kept getting pulled down. So, um, yeah, Morph Market again, cutting edge herb. And there's my, you know, there's my page, my logo. Hey, but um, hey, but don't lie, Vin. You're you're more you're more active on Facebook, aren't you? Well, I'm on all I'm on all you know I'm on both Instagram and Facebook, oh. so. So, so, so you're becoming more IG happy now. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a. I have more followers on the Facebook page um, than Instagram. Oh no, maybe a, you know what? I probably have more on Instagram. Shit, yeah. I think I got like six thousand on Instagram. I, I think that's the way the algorithms work. Like, <laughs> I just think that that's because when we are like our Facebook page got up to like. Five or six thousand, but our Instagram was at forty thousand at one point. Well, you know what happened to me? My Facebook page was up to like twelve thousand, and my Facebook page I started so long ago that Facebook came to me and e emailed me and said, "Vin, we're taking your page down because it's so old. It's not affiliated with a name with a person." Because I started it as a business page in twenty fifteen. Wow. So, um. Here I was, I'm going to lose a page that had 12,000 followers, all organic too, and I didn't buy any of them. And I had to start the new page up and tell everybody on the old page, go to my new page. But what happens is, like you said, the algorithms, no, nobody got those posts. Not everybody got those posts to go over. Hey, hey, hey Vin, I got to ask you, do you think if you were at the point in life that you had to buy a fake following, you would keep selling snakes? <laughs> <laughs> like isn't that kind of ridiculous to you it like, really is that people have to buy followers it, it, but, but dude that th that's a thing that's what's crazy like it's a thing uh, but, but it's not a Vin Russo thing it'll never be Vin Russo is the anti version of being watered down and that's why this was an iconic historical episode uh, do you have anything to sign off with Vin before we let him go Dave Vin Dave um you know, honestly, it was a pleasure, Vin, like always. Um, you know, this is our third time doing this, and every time it goes two, three hours, four hours, I think the one time. I don't think we've ever had the same conversation twice, and I don't think we ever will. Probably not. I agree. And I got to say, Vin, thank you so much for being a part of this, and uh, can't wait to see you, uh, obviously not at dinner next week, but I will see you at the show. <laughs> Fuck. But hey, honestly, hey, hey Vin, I, I want to say, man, without fucking, you know, giving you too many reach arounds, thank you for just being who you are. And what I mean by that is not being a piece of shit. There's a lot of people who've been around as long as you, but there's just too much piece of shit things attached to their name. And you're just very anti that. Like anyone who I consider important to me who gets excited about a podcast has reached out to me excited about this podcast. It's because who you are. So Vin, thank you so much. That's a wrap for Vin Russo, round two. And your book is still available, correct? I only I, I don't only yeah. see I only I don't only see it at shows, but people could still 
find your book on Amazon. And, and, am I correct? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon, eBay. You can get it from U Eco Universe right directly from the publisher. Yes. All right, Vin. I'm. I, listen. I know I've been told no a lot, and you can say no on this one. But has this has let, let, let's really think about this, and not only because the underwear he's wearing right now, but. Has this been the coolest reptile podcast you've ever been on before? This is probably think? one of the best ones. This is up in the top two. Let's go, Vin Russo. Enjoy your <laughs> night, buddy. Thank you so much. Signing off with Vin Russo. Have a good night, Vin. Thanks, Thank guys. Appreciate right. it, man. Thanks. Later, bud. Dave, you're you're going nowhere, buddy. You're staying right here. <laughs> All right, bud. Dude, Dave, thank you for being here. Um, you understand how important it was for me to have you here, though, right? Like you. Like, like you, you were a huge piece of why this podcast was so legendary, and I want you to know that. No, and I always appreciate that. Um, yeah, um, Vin, man, um, you know, like I said, he reached out to me last week and was kind of asking me a little bit about this. And when you called me this morning, I was quite excited. Um, oh, awesome. Like I said, Vin's one of these guys that, again, I don't ever have the same conversation twice. Um, there's always something new to learn, and a lot of times I just hope to keep up with the conversations. And I'll be honest, a lot of things I learned from talking to Vin, I regurgitate in our conversations, buddy. Hundred percent. And that's that's the thing, like 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 you know, the only reason why I love Forrest, like Forrest was a found a regurgitation of advice and information, and that's because he listened a lot. And you're on that same tip, but on, I mean, to me, I feel like you're someone who is important enough to help delegate such a podcast. Mind you, I would really love, um, how do you feel about you being the same player in this situation for Eugene Bassett? Would you want to come through with the Eugene Bassett episode? I have never spoken with the guy. I would love to learn some stuff about Eugene. <laughs> I would love that too. Cause like I said, we, we, we had an episode two weeks ago lined up and he had a family emergency um, happen. And I'm not going to lie, man. I think I was out of my element just bringing him on one-on-one -on -one. Um, just because I only know so much of you, of Eugene. Um, but I know you like you, like, like come on, Dave. Like, I, I, I'll be honest. I know only one thing about Eugene. One story I heard one time. I mean, I know about how immaculate this facility is. Um, you know, I'm talking to guys like Bob Vu have been there on multiple occasions, Steve, um, like I said, he has a history in the hobby, but out of all the OGs in the hobby, I probably know less about him than anybody else. And that is the God honest truth. So everything that I'll be asking him will be because I genuinely want to know because I know nothing about him. So it's probably, I mean, you'd be excited to be a part of a part of a podcast like this then. Oh yeah. Because I don't know shit about it, man. It'll be all new and fresh for me, man. I, yeah. I'll be the kid in the room. I won't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> All right, well, we'll be, we'll be talking more. And uh, obviously, um, I'm really looking forward to next Friday, bud. We got Chad Gray sitting down with us. Yep, be good. I'm always happy to be at Tinley, man. I'm very excited about being in that lobby and talking to people. If you're in the lobby, come on over. I'll probably pull you in for a conversation as long as MJ thinks you're cool enough. That's not true. If Dave pulls you over, I don't have a choice because he did that for two people last year. Um, and I said, Dave, I looked at him like, who are these people? Oh, just let it ride, bud. And we let it ride. So, hey, listen, if Dave calls you over, it's on. That's it. That's yeah. all I'm going to say. Um, but I, before I let you go tonight, Dave, for anyone out there who has been in the hobby within the last couple of years and they're just debating on going to a show, either because they don't want to, they're not the most people person, but whatever. But how can you, how can you explain how important it is? going to a show when it comes to being a part of this industry how, how would you explain that um well there's a lot of pros and cons the pros are you get to see and meet people that you might never even know existed um i did a little show in missouri about six months ago i met a random guy at a show that had 30 tables that has over 100 woma pythons in his collection doesn't have a facebook page doesn't have an instagram flip phone and may have the biggest woman collection in the United States. So things like that, opportunities that wouldn't normally present themselves. And truth, I like being face-to-face -face with the customer. Um, 
Oh. You know, Vin's the negative, like with Vin, Vin doesn't want to overstress out the animals. And, you know, we alternate animals out through shows if we're doing too many. But um, I don't know, man, that face to face, meeting people and doing their thing. I, I get excited seeing people I wouldn't normally see. And I get excited when people come over that just want to hang out with me, to be honest with you. So shows have their pros and cons, man. You go to the big ones, go to the small ones. They're all equal. You never know what you're going to see. There could be a diamond in the rough. I've got so much cool stuff I found at the shows over the years. I got a brand new boa mutation I'm working with because wow. I had a conversation with a guy who found it at a pet store and gave it to me. Didn't give it to me. I still talk to him. Not enough. If he's listening to this, I didn't return his last text message. He's probably pissed. But really <laughs> a great guy. Really was um, glad that he gave me the opportunity to work with the animal. And I'm still working with it now. So you never know, man. Go to the shows. Fuck. Yeah, man. Um, Dave, I just want you to know, uh, first and foremost, before I get into my reach around um, closeout with you, I want you to kind of tell anybody who is curious about what Dave's going to have that he's excited about displayed at Tinley. Let's talk about it, buddy. What? What? what, no. like, what, what, what I mean, because you're going to be, you're, you are vending at Tinley, correct? Yes. Um, so. All I'm going to have at Tinley is boa constrictors. I will not have a single ball python with me. If you have any requests, anything that you've seen on our morph market, you want me to bring with, I'll be happy to do so. But we're only going to be displaying bows at the show. And a lot of the bows that we're going to be bringing with are going to be ones that are out of our holdback rack and for some projects we're working on. So, yeah, I'm in boa aisle. I don't even know if we're still calling it that. So I'm only bringing boas. So if you like boas, come see me. If you don't, there's plenty of other tables at the show for you. But I got to tell you guys, anyone out there who's looking to get into the boas, if you want a foundation, if you want a good first few stepping stones into getting to the right fucking direction, obviously there's cutting edge herbs, but goddamn custom scales. Do not sleep on custom scales. And if you go see Dave, let him know that the trap sent you. Dave, have a good night. Thank you so much, buddy. Um, literally, I'm not upset about not, us ha not having dinner Friday because we have a podcast together Friday, so that's fine. Uh, uh, I'll be honest. I, I don't want to be an asshole, but the fact that Vin even asked me to go to dinner with him, I'm just going to be selfish and enjoy years of this until he invites somebody else. And I, and I thought it was you who was setting this up, so I get it. It's fine. Yeah, um, but I did skip my dinner with Vin last time for our fucking podcast, just so you know. Yeah, but hold on. What time is your dinner? Um, I think we're going to shimmy out right away. I think you said we're going on at 9 this time, so that'll give me time to go have dinner and come back. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. You have dinner at 9? No, no. We're doing our thing at 9. What time you have I'm dinner? I'm going to go out to dinner with Vin as soon as they close the doors. What is that, 5, 6 o'clock? Oh, yeah, we're good. We'll have time. Yeah, we got plenty of time. And guys, worst comes to worst, I'll show up 45 minutes late, buddy. If you're what I am like, and that is a huge Dave Levison fan, then be ready for next Friday night, live and direct from what used to be Bars Bananas, but now is the just whatever the fuck, I'm All-American Bar at Tinley. But it's going down. Me and Dave, Chad Gray, and any random we happen to see. Dave, can I get a virtual hug? Thank you, buddy. Hey, listen, I love you, man. Honestly, you are a huge fire within what I got going on, and I will see you next week. That's a wrap for Dave Levison. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. Catch everybody next weekend in Tinley. Love you, buddy. Have a good night, man. Love you too, bud. Thank you, guys. Three-hour podcast for the trap. Love it, man. I need more three-hour podcasts, but give me a reason. That's all I got to say. Give me a reason. I'll give you three hour podcasts. This, I mean, this could have easily been a four hour podcast, no doubt, but I'm not going to give you all this goddamn steak on one plate. You feel me? Because we have Dave Levison, like I said, next Friday, live and direct from Tinley. From Tinley! If you're not going to Tinley, there's no reason why you should not be watching this podcast next week because we're all in the fucking zone. Dave is pulling anyone he wants to pull to sit down and talk with us. And I'm not going to lie. Tinley's, all every podcast you see from Tinley Weekend is brought to you by Ship Your Rep Pal. So I do want to say shout out to, uh, shout to Chad. Okay, are you kidding me? God damn it. What a fucking legend. Shout out to Susie. 
shout out to the entire um the entire ship your reptiles team but they are the sponsors of the tinley trip and a lot of big things happening next weekend so make sure you guys stay tuned make sure you hit that subscribe button hit that like button notification bell be on top of it because it's going to go down i love everyone who tapped in tonight thank you for giving me your time of day for this iconic episode it's going down this sunday though you guys know that i have talked a lot about my buddy who has put me on so many different directions in this game and that is canny from upside down geckos and we're getting back down to gecko business let's separate the real from the fake that's right you want to get into the gecko game how do you not get scammed it's going down this sunday 4 p.m pacific standard time following our trap talk patreon after party okay join the patreon family please guys if you enjoyed what you saw tonight if you want to support what you heard tonight if you want to get more behind the scenes about what you've seen tonight then join the trap talk patreon family the first link you see in the description below as soon as you join the patreon family you get a link to the discord taps you in with over 160 fucking trappers in the building longevity shit and i gotta say again thank you to the sponsors gary shavino gs reptiles go to youtube subscribe to his youtube channel go to instagram and that is gs reptiles number one youtuber in the game when it comes to just all around keeping reptiles and uh also don't forget support brian barcheck brian park brian barcheck strong it's a fucking vibe shout out to the reptarium i love the reptarium the whole team at the reptarium love the barcheck's and i love you for supporting the barcheck's and uh make sure you go give me a follow on instagram trap god 619 Follow the podcast's Instagram page as well, Trap Talk Podcast. And uh, guys, have a good night, man. Honestly, at the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for spending your life with me. And let's fucking take this shit to the top, man. At the end of the day, we put the animals first, nothing else. Thank you, Vin. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.